years. Um, so children are, uh, you can head them down there and they'll be taken good care of. Our prayer team as well also has a room set up downstairs. So those of you who would like prayer, um, please head downstairs as well and they'll be happy to take care of you. Um, also, there is no service tomorrow night. Repeat that. Say it out loud. No service tomorrow night. So if you come, the doors will be locked. So I do have an idea of what you can do with your time. Those of you who might be behind in your homework, it would be a great time to get caught up on your homework. If your homework's caught up, you could always review those wonderful notes you've been taking. So that'll give you something to do, an activity for tomorrow night. We will pick back up again on Friday night. So what time are we to be here on Friday night? 6.57. 6.57 would be great. <laughs> and also on Friday, um, there will be some snack foods downstairs for those folks who are coming in quickly from work. Um, and then on Sabbath, we will be having our divine service at 11, followed by a fellowship luncheon. And then we'll be back again for what time on the night? Probably 6.55, maybe, okay? <laughs> Make sure you're well in your seat for 7 o'clock, okay? And those of you, if you forgot to bring your Bible and left it at home when we were doing our scripture references this evening, feel free to use the Bibles that are in the back of the pew. Scott? Family, good evening. Please, uh, if you're able to, please stand for opening prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, you know that for me personally, one of those most precious times is that moment of silence before someone begins to pray. That quiet epic in time where the earth seems to move a little slower and the space between us and you becomes smaller. Father, tonight we ask once again that, that you will condescend in the form of your Holy Spirit to be with us. We pray, Lord, that you will fill this place with the presence of your latter rain. For we are talking about end time messaging tonight and have been since last Saturday. And so, Father, may your latter rain fill this place. May your Holy Spirit fill each home that is represented tonight online. And may you continue to stir within the mind, heart, and soul of each one, within the, the hearing of our speaker tonight. Father, may there be no distractions. Father, may here in the sanctuary, may there be no distractions. May there be no talking with the person next to us or um, being separate out in the foyer instead of here in the sanctuary. Help us to be together because Jesus is looking for a unified people. May you be with our speaker tonight. Once again, may, may he decrease for you must increase. Change us, transform us, woo us in, and make us yours forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Our opening song will be 279, Only Trust Him. Please stand. soul by sin oppressed there's 
Hello again. Hello. It's quiz time. Quiz question number one. Why is it necessary to recognize, embrace, and disclose our distinctive identity in Christ? And please remember to raise your hand when you're about to answer. Yes. Amen. Amen. Do you enjoy the quiz questions? Do they help with your retention, hopefully? Question number two is fill in the blank, and there's just one word tonight. Last night was two words. Fill in the blank. Sin always causes us to blank. <laughs> Someone other than Patrick. <laughs> there you go. Very well done. I think if, um, so I used to be a professor of biology and university, both in Ontario and the US. And I think if my students had questions like these on their exams, I would have been more popular. <laughs> so question number three, our final question. What are the two primary symbols or types in the sanctuary work of redemption? 
There you go. Excellent. Excellent. So that concludes our quiz for tonight. The next quiz will be on Friday evening. Thank you so much. Good evening, church. Yes, so I'm here to present the health nuggets. Please excuse me for my voice. I just pray that the Lord help me to be able to do this this evening because I lost my voice yesterday and I'm still struggling to get it now. So I hope that we get it. So our health nugget this evening is about sleep. I love this topic and it's something I'm struggling with. So I'm not actually presenting it to you. I'm also telling myself what I need to be doing. Yes, yeah, so as you see on the slide, it says, I would like to talk about sleep. I'm sure we could all use some tips. The earlier you go to bed, the more likely you are to fall into a deep sleep and the hormone called epitalamine will be released. God designed our brain to be learning new things right up until we die. Many people's brains deteriorate because they stop learning new things. We should ever be learning new things. Epitalamine increases learning capacity. To be able to understand and retain the new things we are learning, we need to go to bed early. And ask a teacher which kids had a late night and they will be able to point them out because they are the ones who just aren't getting what the teacher is saying. They aren't retaining the information. Next slide. So epitalamine not only increases learning capacity, but also slows down aging. What want to slow, okay, also slow down aging. And do we really want to slow down our aging? Do we want to look better? We want to look younger when we are getting older? For sure, then what we need to do is to go to bed early. Let's talk about the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is responsible for the rest and rejuvenate, rejuvenate hormones in the brain. It only releases these hormones between the hours of yeah, it's 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. or 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. during the winter. So if you are going to bed later than this, you are missing this window and benefits. Serotonin is the other one we'll be talking about. It is the mood hormone. Have your children had a late night and then are no good the next day because they didn't get that serotonin? Parents are not much better in the same circumstance. We can be crabby or impatient if you want to feel great all day, every day, go to bed early. Minutes, okay. So um, another hormone that is being released is the, with a, by the pineal gland is the adenine vasotocin. It's a natural painkiller. If you are suffering from pain, go to bed early and this natural painkiller will kick in. So exercise also helps with that. So if you exercise one hour a day, you will get a better, um, a better production of all these, um, these things that our bodies need. So there are some tips. There are some tips on how to increase sleep. For example, sleep in darkness. Do not go to bed with a full stomach. Be sure to stop eating around three hours, four hours before you go to bed. And then 
what will decrease sleep? When you worry about so many things or you are on the screen or your phone before you fall asleep. So our teenagers today suffer from mental health and many other things because they spend too much time on the screen and they go to bed late, they, raise up, they rise up late, and so on and so forth. Also, coffee or caffeine cuts this good sleep and feel good hormone by 60%. Alcohol in a 40% reduction in output, it causes a 40% reduction in the output of these hormones. So to put to sleep, you cause to, you'll be caused to wake up and you feel not, you put you to sleep, but you'll be caused to wake up and you'll not feel well rested enough for the day. So your batteries will not be charged. So research shows that it doesn't work to help you sleep. Hopefully, you have been encouraged to adopt some good sleep habits. And I know if you do, you'll find yourself having more energy and your brain will be sharper. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I hope that you're all being blessed and uh, that, and I hope you're all in a good mood. <laughs> and I hope I don't spoil it. <laughs> but we, we owe God so much, so much, that whatever we give in return can never come even close to what he does for us. And um, I just want to, uh, in a sense, uh, repeat um, a uh, story that, uh, it's not a story, uh, uh, really it's an incident that the Lord um, gave in the Bible for us and to just sort of show us what God really, really um, appreciates. Uh, so he said he looked up and saw the rich men, what were they doing? Casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also whom? A certain poor widow casting in there how much? Her two mites, which I think we could maybe, two pennies, yeah. And he said, truly I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. How is that? That doesn't sound, they were rich men, they were casting their, um, you know, uh, rich gifts into the treasury, but she gave more than they all. Why? He says, for all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury, what is penury? Her poor circumstance, you know, um, not rich, poor, uh, has cast in all the living that she had. So how, what can we say to this story? God looks at the heart, how she truly sacrificed because she loved the Lord. She wanted to be a part. She didn't want to be kept, and she gave her all. So God looks at the heart, not the amount you know, uh, necessarily. Uh, we should give as much as we uh, can, and, and it should be maybe a little bit of an, uh, a sacrifice, but God um, counts us giving out of a loving heart for him. So let's all do that. So I want to call the um, deacons to come forward, please. And we shall bow our heads and say a word of prayer. Father in heaven, tonight we are reminded of all that you have done and continue to do for us. You gave all when you gave your only begotten son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. And Lord, now we ask that you bless these small gifts that we give, Lord. May they, they be blessed by you and bring uh, mighty results, Lord, and bless each one that gives. 
We pray, Lord, and bless us as we listen to your word, and we thank you for this opportunity and um, uh, uh, to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. stand for a theme song. Father in heaven, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill this church tonight in such a way that we have never experienced it before. Father, you know more than we, but time is almost finished. We need you to work a miracle for us tonight and the rest of this series. Please, Lord, grant us your presence. We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. It's Wednesday night. Now, that may not mean much to some. It means many things. Number one is prayer meeting. We know that. But that means that we only have a few nights left in our series together, and we have just scratched the surface. We're about two days behind where we should be in our study. It's almost like we need tomorrow night, but by God's grace, we're praying, God, that he will cram in what we need to understand because I believe that we're living in a most solemn time. Are you with me? We need Jesus like we've never needed Jesus before. And so my brother and sister, I've been praying. I'm telling you, every night I look at who's here and I pray for you. I'm asking you to pray for me. We need each other. We should be praying for each other in this time. My brother and sister, I'm looking. I don't know everybody's name, but I look at your faces. Wherever you're sitting, whether you're on the top, on the, on, the bow, or on, the, on the floor, I look at your faces and I pray, God, Lord, bless us. Draw us closer to Christ because we're living in a very special time. In fact, I want you to notice what this says as we turn uh, to the screen. In First Manuscript, page 33, let's read this together. Father, please anoint your words. We've opened them. Bless us now and in Jesus' name, amen. It says, it is too late in the day to feed with milk. You know, sometimes we're used to just getting milk. You know, who gets milk? Adults or babies? Babies. If souls a month or two old in the truth, 
who are about to enter the time of trouble such as never was, if they cannot hear not some of the straight truth, but how much? All of the straight truth or endure the strong meat of the straightness of the way, how will they not sit? But the prophet says, how will they what? Stand in the day of battle. God is trying to prepare somebody that can stand. It says, truths that we have been years learning must be learned in a few months by those who now embrace the third angel's message. I believe, brothers and sisters, that you and I have but a few short months to a few short years at the most. In fact, I'm going to write down on the board a number that we have not written, uh, 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 focused on yet, but we'll get there in a moment. What number did I put on this board? What number did I put on? 2025, plus or minus. This is a very significant number, prophetically. We talked about 2020 being the beginning of the end. We spoke about the crisis of the pandemic that swept the world that the Bible prophesied about and what it means. 2025 is another one of those times that you and I must understand it's coming, plus or minus, and we need to be praying, God, Lord, please give us a little more time. You know, 2025 is not a long way away. Am I right or wrong? It's near to us. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. Does 2025 mean something for Canada? Yes or no? What does it mean for Canada? This says Canada's next federal election must be held by the fall of 2025. Your government has voted. Though that they, you, you could meet and, and vote earlier than that, they said no later than 2025 can your government go without having a switch or a vote so that someone can take over the government. And I want you to understand something. This is prophetic. Almost every country of the world right now is going through elections. Am I right or wrong? Over 4 billion people on the planet, or in every country, you can go from the east to the west, from the north to the south, nation after nation, and America is just before this. Now, my brothers and sisters, who's in right now? Who, who is leading the government of Canada right now? Or at least, who is openly leading the government right now? Do you know that face? Now, it's amazing, stress can sometimes age us, am I right? Remember when he came in office, he looked like a little boy, am I right? Just like Obama, you remember President Obama, he came in office, black hair. He left office, his hair was gray, white. Canada's Justin Trudeau says he thinks daily about leaving his crazy job. I'm going to tell you something, you may laugh right now, but you won't laugh in a little while. Is more serious than that. You see, something is about to take place. This means something. This means something. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, in an interview with Broadcast Radio Canada, Mr. Trudeau also spoke about personal sacrifice of his job. He's lost his family in office. That's not a joke. If you lost your family, you wouldn't laugh at it. It says Canada's next general election must be held by October 2025. Now, my brothers and sisters, we may go and think, oh, just like another election. This is not just another election. Nowhere in the history of the world have there been so many elections like this. Now, my brothers and sisters, Heavenly Father, please, we don't want nothing to distract us now. The devil is afraid. Please, dear God, sometimes we forget because of our minds. We don't recognize it. But, Lord, please forgive us. Help us to honor and respect you. You are real and you are in this place right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, tonight we can't have any distraction. Look, I would rather have one person in this room listening to the message than to have thousands and are careless and indifferent. If somebody talks tonight, I'm going to have to escort them out and just say, look, you're going to have to go out there. You, you cannot remain in here and be a distraction. Jesus is getting ready to come. The world is about to end. And today we are so careless that we don't recognize our salvation is at stake. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is something that's happening. Look what this says now. Trudeau will be prime minister until what? Talk to me. 2025. Now, do you know that even in the remnant church, that the next general conference session is scheduled for 2025? We're going to see that both in the world and the church, this is a climatic year. It means something. Now, my brothers and sisters, all of this is happening right now. And guess what's going on? Look what this says. What does that say? Civil war is both timely and what? Prescient. We heard those words about 2020. But now this is talking about something else. It says civil war. How many heard of the film that was just released 
that shook up the world and caused civil war. Let me see the hands of those who have heard of that film. You didn't hear of that film? Now this is, Civil War is a film that will enter the canon of the greatest movies of this decade. The film written and directed by Alex Garland was released today, and this was last Friday, just before we started this meeting, called April 12, 2024. And the reason why that's significant is because the literal Civil War in America started on what date? April 12th. They're saying this means something. I feel privileged to have experienced an early access screening last night because it was allowed me to get a head start on both processing and praising it, even though the first thing I said when the credits rolled was that this was literally traumatizing. You know, one of the women that actually filmed, uh, the, and she was one of the actors, even though it was an act, do you know that she developed uh, PSTD, which is a trauma that most people get when they go through a war, and she was just an actor. It was so serious to her, that, 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 and filming it, that it shook up her head, shook up her mind. She had to go through some type of training to relax her after going through that. And I'm going to tell you something, it's going to be worse in real life. This is... This was literally traumatizing. I love Civil War, she said. Garland tells the story of a journalist navigating dystopia America where a civil war between the U.S. government and rebel forces reaches its peak. It was a movie about another civil war, not the first one, historically, but a second civil war coming to the United States of America. Somebody says, oh, that would never take place. And why would we be interested in Canada about a civil war in America? You better be very interested. My brothers and sisters, look what this says. The prophet, the prophet of God says this in manuscript release, manuscript release, page 305, it says in, let's read this together, in what? India? What else? China? What else? Russia? Question, have we heard of these names in the news today? Every one of them, and the prophet spoke of it over 100 years ago. It says, and the cities of America, there's a relationship between these two. It says thousands of men and women are dying of what? Now, listen to me, brothers and sisters. Because of the war that Russia and Ukraine are in, starvation, beginning of some of the food that's supposed to be around the world, global food crisis as a result. Now, it says the money men, rich, because they have the power, control the market. They purchase at low rates all they can obtain and then sell at greatly increased prices. This means, let's read this together, starvation to the poor classes and will result. Question, past, present, or future, will result. Future. It will result in a civil war. Now, I want you to notice that someone said, oh, that's talking about the civil war that happened in America in the 1800s. Does anybody know when the historical civil war took place? Anybody know the dates of the historical civil war? History. Anybody know the dates? 1861 through 1865. That was the historical civil war in America. Now, look, what the, look at when this was written. Look at when this was written. At the very bottom, what year does that say? 18 what? Now, the prophet says in 1899... 30 years after the Civil War, she said, look, the, the, the Civil War, it will result, in other words, a future Civil War after the 1900s. Then that wouldn't be the first. You know what that would be? Talk to me, somebody. The second. I've been talking about this for years. We've been talking about this for years, many years, over 10 years. We've been talking about this step by step that this would take place. And before, people said, oh, it's crazy. The Civil War in America and the world never take place. They don't say that anymore today. Now, notice... There will be, look what happens right after the Civil War. Notice right after the Civil War. There will be what? A time of trouble such as never was. And at that time, Michael shall stand up. So the last thing we're going to see before the priest finishes his work in the most holy place, the last thing that we're going to see is a civil war in America that's going to become worldwide. It's going to turn into a revolution. Now, my brothers and sisters, question. Is anything like that happening? Look what this says. New York Times, 2024. Civil war and its terrifying premonition of what? American collapse. They're saying this movie is showing us where America is. Going into Alex Garlinson's astonishing new film, Civil War, expected to be irritated by the implausibility of his premise. This, this person writing said he thought he was going to be aggravated because there's no way that a civil war could take place in America. I'm not talking about the idea that America could devolve into a vicious inter internecine armed conflict. That seems possible, if not probable. In one 2022 poll, 43% of Americans said they thought the Civil War within the next decade was at least somewhat likely. In other words, they said that before 2030 is up, they believe another Civil War is going to take place. All of the information points to the same thing. This is... 
But now, and I've seen civil war, which is neither glib nor cynical, Garland's decision to keep the film's politics a little ambiguous seems like a source of his power. The emphasis here should be on a little because contrary to what I've read, his values aren't inscrutable, just lightly worn. Yes, there's a reference early on. We learned that the film's heroine, violent, traumatized combat photographer named Lee is famous for shooting the Antifa massacre, but we never find out if Antifa members were the perpetrators. In other words, he kept the politics hidden of what it was really talking about but then it says it's not a stretch to interpret that the film as a premonition of how a seething entropic country could what collapse under the weight of a Donald Trump's return someone says but Donald Trump could never become president again because he is now being charged with crimes let me tell you something do you know there has never been a political figure as Mr. Trump that has been charged with crime, has been charged with many accounts, that is leading the polls right now today. You better understand, this is prophetic in nature. Now, my brothers and sisters, how the American Civil War made Canada. You mean that historically, the Civil War was tied to Canada's rise? I wonder if the last Civil War will be tied to Canada's collapse. We're going to show you that your Canadian professors, your Canadian experts have said they're afraid of what's going on in America because, brothers and sisters, there's a tight connection between America and Canada. Look what this says in the Canadian Encyclopedia. I, I took it from your encyclopedia, lest you thought I made it up. American Civil War and Canada. The American Civil War was fought between the Northern States and the Southern Confederate States, which withdrew from the United States. The war left cities in ruin. But do you know that Canada played a large part in it? Look what this says. Coming events. Remember that jigsaw puzzle? Remember that? But the final piece is the National Sunday Law. But before the National Sunday Law comes civil war. Comes chaos. Comes revolution. Before that, beginning and the end, we've seen those things. But now, my brothers and sisters, we know that this is going to lead to that. We know that a revelation is coming. We know a revolution is coming. We know that this is just upon us. But now watch. This says, should Canada brace for a second U.S. Civil War. Do you think you need to brace, yes or no? The, the Bible says it's coming. The prophet says it's coming. The thinking men says it's coming. My brothers and sisters, you and I better get ready for what's about to take place. It talks about it coming right before our very eyes. And guess when it's all set to explode? Do you know that it will take a miracle to get past 2025 without a civil war? It will take a miracle. Now, can God work miracles, yes or no? God can work miracles, but you know he normally works miracles as a result of prayer. Look what this says. The prophet saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds that the wind should not blow. Remember, we studied that Revelation 7. God holding the four winds of Revelation 7. It says, a vast, this points out the work we have now to do. A vast responsibility, let me blow that up so we can see a little better. A vast responsibility is developing upon men and women of prayer throughout the land to do what? What's that next word? Do you think that means writing down notes to the government, petitioning the government? No, 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 no. It means getting on our knees in a week of prayer and revival. We need to petition that God will sweep back the cloud of evil and give, talk to me somebody, a few more years of grace. I'm telling you something. If we don't pray for this years of grace, this will erupt before 2025. Do you know if it would erupt before 2025? Do you know what would happen to us? Do you know that the bloodiest of all wars was not World War I? It wasn't World War II. It wasn't, brothers and sisters, the, uh, uh, what we saw in World War II. Or it wasn't Vietnam, all that bloody battle. Do you know that the bloodiest war we've ever seen was the Civil War in America? More people died in the Civil War. Old, young, children, adults. More people died then in all other wars combined. Do you know that when Sister White was alive, she prophesied of the first one too. And she said right now, and while they were sitting in churches, she said some of our children in this church are going to die in that war. And they laughed. <laughs> no, prophet, she, she, maybe she had mess, she was mesmerized. But in a few years, their children were dead. I'm going to tell you something. You better not play with your family. If your husband, your father, your, your, your wife, your mother, 
You better say, Lord, let's start praying for our home. Let's start setting up morning and evening devotion. Let's cut off the television. Let's cut off the foolishness. Let's now start praying together as a family because we don't yet know Jesus. Our children don't know Jesus. And it's not their fault. When I see a young person talking, I'm not upset at them. It's, it's their fault of us as adults. When I was a child, I remember being so careless. I remember coming to church sometimes and just playing around, laughing and joking. And the minister would just let me talk and say nothing. I wish the minister would have stopped me. You see, I didn't take church as serious or the Bible or God as serious. When I grew up, I grew up running the streets like a fool. Hair was braided back, my pants hanging down, looking like a fool, thinking I was cool. And it wasn't until God and this message reached me that I understood how important it was. But you know that somebody has to wake up our children and say, look, this is not a joke. This is why I will stop the church and tell a child, be quiet. Sometimes take them out. It's because sometimes if you don't take them out, they'll never be able to be brought back in. You know, some people say, oh, well, you know, the church, uh, it has to be a hospital. So then you can let them do whatever they want. Let me tell you something. If you do that to the church and let people do whatever they want, they will never see it as a place of shelter. In order to make this a place of shelter, it must be welcome to anyone, but it must be a place that only God and his presence can be allowed. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is getting ready to come and we should be praying, Lord, give us a few more years of grace. And I'm praying this. I don't know about you. I'm praying, Lord, please give us more than 2025. We, we are not ready yet. But let me tell you something. God can't wait forever. There is a limit. And that limit is almost reached, brothers and sisters. And so, if we're going to understand this, we laid a foundation. I want to make sure, before we get ready to get deep into our study tonight, we laid a foundation. And I want to make sure that we're together. Remember we said, to understand this and get ready for the coming of the Lord, it's like putting together a puzzle. Remember that? How many things do we need to understand? Talk to me. Three. Tell me the first. I want to see if you're good. First is what? The picture. Second is what? The borders. In other words, when you shake out that puzzle, you're going to put it together... You look at the picture, but then you don't just put everything together. You start putting the edges of those pictures together. Am I right? You put the border. You see them doing that right now, putting the border together. Those borders are the limits. You can't go beyond it. But that's not it. Once you put the border together, the third thing is what? Talk to me. Then you got to put together the inside. Now, do you know what the inside is? We're going to find, brothers and sisters, what the inside is. But first, let me test you. What is the picture? You know it now. What is the picture? The plan of redemption. That's what the entire Bible is about from Genesis to the Revelation. This issue is not about civil war. The devil is just using that. This issue is not about climate change. The devil is just using that. This is really about the plan of redemption. Satan wants to retain power over this universe. This is a great controversy. My brothers and sisters, we know that there's a word picture, but God is also not only giving us this word picture from Genesis to the Revelation, but in this Bible, he's given us a pictorial picture. What is the picture? Talk to me. I can't hear you. The what? In that sanctuary. With its three compartments, the outer court and the holy place and the most holy place. And if we understand that picture, we'll understand what needs to be put together in the Bible and in coming events. We're going to see that tonight by the grace of God. But then we see the border. What are the borders? The border is the limits. Does the plan of redemption have limits? Yes or no? Or can the plan of redemption go on forever? I heard one person say, they say, oh, you know what? Jesus, if he wanted to, he could give us another 6,000 years before he comes. My brothers and sisters, that's not the story of redemption. That's not the plan of redemption. That's not the way God works. If you want to know how God works, God's, God's way, thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. And he operates on a number of seven, on sevens. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is the limit of this history of redemption? What is the limit? Talk to me, somebody. 7,000 years years this is the limit seven thousand years but brothers and sisters just knowing that is not enough now we got to get into the inside what is this seven thousand history about what's inside of it now my brothers and sisters when you get inside then we find what the real issue is and we'll find the real issue is the work of redemption and that's why we studied great time little work little work uh, excuse me great work little time now my brothers and sisters this is the real issue and what that work is is right there what is the work that must take place in this history of redemption what is the work what is that picture de depicting what is that picture depicting a foot crushing the head of a serpent whose foot does it represent jesus you remember in the first promise god declared the end from the beginning 
He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And we know that seed is the child, the offspring, the man, the man child, Jesus Christ, that would crush the head of the serpent. Now, my brothers and sisters, this started at the cross, but it didn't finish there. We started it last night, this great work in a little time. When will this fully be finished? When Jesus comes out of the most holy place on the day of atonement. My brothers and sisters, listen to me. The real issue is how to bring Jesus out of the most holy place on time so that he can crush the head of the serpent. Do you know that we'll never get redemption? We'll never get Eden restored until the serpent is gone. Listen to me. What creature did Satan use to start the history of sin? A serpent. We lost Eden through the agency of a serpent. And we will only regain Eden when that serpent is destroyed. And do you know it's going to take you and me to work with Jesus to make sure his head is crushed? This is what this is about. And no other religion knows this but the remnant church. You know what we're doing? We're sleeping. The prophet says that Jesus was pointing to the world with hands extended, pointing in every direction. And said the world is perishing in ignorance. And Seventh-day Adventists are sleeping. Brothers and sisters, I want to stop sleeping tonight. I want to wake up. What do you say? Now, do you know that we're going to wake up? We've got to pray. Do you want to pray? And so every night, we've been spending how much time praying? Two minutes. Is that a long time? It's not a long time. We want to take the next two minutes, and we want to start praying. Lord, give us a few more years. Lord, be with our church. Lord, help us to understand. But listen, don't just look about everybody else. Me, Lord. Wouldn't it be a shame to be a Seventh-day Adventist, to be a Christian, to come to church and prayer meeting and Sabbath, go to church? Wouldn't it be a shame to, to, to record these meetings, to lead these meetings, to preach these meetings, and then to be lost? That would be a shame. I don't know about you, but I made up in my mind, I am not going to be lost. And by the grace of Jesus, my family is not going to be lost. As for me and we will serve the Lord. And I'm talking to men tonight, husbands, fathers. If your family is lost, God's not going to come to your wife first. He's not going to come to the children if they're talking and careless first. You know what he's going to come to? He's going to come to Adam first. Now, Eve touched the fruit, ate it. But God said, Adam, where are you? God's going to come to the men first and say, what are you doing? Are you leading your home in morning, evening worship? Are you leading your family? Are you giving an example? Are you commanding your house after you? You know, Abraham, Abraham didn't just serve God. He commanded his family after him. Somebody said, well, I can't control my wife and my child. Are you a man? We need Jesus. That's the greatest man in this world, the man, Christ Jesus. And you know that if I haven't been a man, do you know that Jesus can make me a man? Someone said, but you don't know how dirty I am. My life is messed up. I'm dirty. All the dirt that's in my past. Well, do you know that God took dirt the first time and made a man? And if we will put our dirt in his hand, God will make a man out of us. I want to start over. What do you say? And so, brothers and sisters, as we get into this message tonight, it should be a bell and a pomegranate, but I don't think we'll get to a bell or a pomegranate. We're two days behind. Let's pray for two minutes. How long? Would you approach the Lord in prayer with me? Forget this congregation. Talk to Jesus. You're on the Internet. Please talk to Jesus. This is not a joke. And after two minutes, we'll get into the message this evening.
Oh, Father in heaven, never before have we been in a time such as we're in tonight. And I beg you, Father, that you will send the presence of the Holy Spirit to envelop this church. That we will sense, Lord, that we are not in any ordinary time, but that the Holy Spirit is making final appeals to Canada and to the world and to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that even the passerby that passes this building will know that Christ is in this place. I pray that you will unseal the fountain of heaven, remove every distraction, quiet any talking mouth, remove the careless, and Lord, show us that we need Jesus like never before. Father, I'm fickle, I'm feeble, I'm frail, but you are not. You are strong and uh, omnipotent. Please, dear God, manifest your presence in this place tonight to show us, if we come to you, that you can produce in us a radical change through radical faith and love in Jesus Christ. Abide with us now, Father. Please, dear God, come to be with us, for we ask this, not because we're worthy, but because of the precious name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to turn to the book of Matthew. What book did I say? We're going to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen, we're going to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, Matthew chapter seven. Now, brothers and sisters, as we have studied together night after night, we have seen clearly from the word of God. We have proved with prophetic clarity that you and I today are looking at the end of the world and the coming of Christ and that that is an event that's not in some far off distant future, that we are the generation that are going to be alive to witness the coming of Jesus Christ in our flesh, in our time. And Jesus is trying to tell us, please get ready. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We do not have long left. Jesus is about to come. And the sad reality is we're not ready. But God wants us to be ready. God does not want one person to be lost. I mean, not even one. And this is why Jesus has allowed these meetings to come to bury, uh, uh, bury Canada. This is why he's allowed these meetings to be streamed into your internet and into your living rooms because he understands that in 2024, a crisis is about to take place. That we're living in a time where the majority of mankind has lost a sense of the value of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know that's the truth. Even though the first commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, we put everything before Jesus. We put work, we put school, we put play, we put materials, we put relationships. You know that a man would say, don't come right now, Lord. Don't let the end come. I've got to get married first. How can we think of human relationships more than Jesus? You see, the problem is we put something before God, but God said, if you put husband or wife or father or mother or children or anything before me, you are not worthy of me. My brothers and sisters, nothing is more valuable than Jesus Christ. And Jesus is telling us right now that this is the time that we're living in where mankind, a generation today, to today, that, that, that we are we're more interested in the internet than in entering into an experience with our loving Lord. And this should concern us. Why? Because any time in history, you study a generation, you study a civilization, you study a nation, any time in history where a generation has forgotten God, it was unmistakable evidence that that nation was about to face a great tragedy, a great calamity, a great crisis. And if you're honest with ourselves, we know that every nation on this globe has forgotten God. Am I right or wrong? We have put everything before God, every nation. And America, the United States of America, is leading out. And Canada is not far behind. We have gone the way of Egypt. You remember ancient Egypt? You remember when, 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 in Exodus 5 when Moses came to deliver his people? The, the Pharaoh said, who is God? And when it came to that point, Egypt was brought down to the lowest nation, almost wiped off the map through those plagues. Any time a nation forgets God, judgments falls upon it. We've gone the way of Babylon. We've gone the way of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. We've gone the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the only thing that can fall upon us is judgments and calamities and crisis. And my friends, it's about to happen to America. It's about to happen to Canada. It's about to happen to India and China and Africa and in every island of this world. It's getting ready to fall upon the entire planet. And God is saying, please get ready. We're not ready, brothers and sisters. And do you know what the sad reality is? That the majority of God's people in the midst of this worldly crisis, the majority of God's people have never been ready for a religious crisis. 
You think about it. Think about the flood. Only eight people saved on board that ark. You think about Simon and Gomorrah. Only one man made it out. You say, what about his children? Don't you remember? Before it was over with, they had incest with their father. They didn't make it out. The Bible says the one soul of righteous, a lot was vexed. My brothers and sisters, you'll find that when you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of time to the end of time, do you know that less than 1% of the people of God have ever been ready? That over 99%, not of the world, but over 99% of God's people have been unready for every crisis. Why would it be different in the last days? It was that way in the flood. It was that way during the time of the Exodus. It was that way during the time of Gideon. It was that way when the, in the Babylonian captivity. It was that way at the first coming of Christ. It was that way, the Bible says in the last days, when the whole world is wandering after the beast, that only a remnant would be safe from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. You don't have to take my words for it. Look at the words of Jesus. Will you believe Jesus? Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 7. What book did I say? Matthew chapter 7, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 13. Notice the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. What does the Bible say? It says, enter ye in when? At the straight gate. Why? For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And not a few, but what? Talk to me, somebody. Many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14 says, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And not many, but what? Few there be that find it. In life, only few are going to be saved. Not because they could be, but because only few are willing to sacrifice everything for Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what God is telling us now. God is trying to show us that this crisis is just before us. Now, I don't have time to go through this. I normally go through and show that, that, that 99% of God's people from the beginning of time to the end of time will be shaken out. Do you know that we're told in the remnant church, in the seven remnant church, when the Sunday law is passed, less than 1% will be ready when that crisis breaks. Someone says, well, I'm not ready. I don't think that, that the end of time is really at hand because look at how many people go to church. Never look at a parking lot to determine what God is doing. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that the majority of the world are going to wonder after the beast? Only a remnant are going to do it. And I'm going to tell you something. Do you know that there might be a few people in Canada? We're told that less than 1%. Now, my brother and sisters, I know I'm going to tell you time. I don't have time to do it at night. I'm going to just go through one point. I'm going to look at one, one, one example. Many examples in the Bible, I'm going to look at one. Now, this says... In volume one of the testimony, 608, it says, in concluding this narrative, I would say that we're living in a most, what's that say? A most what? Solemn time. Now, you remember in the Jewish nation, the day of atonement, the typical atonement was the most solemn time of all that year. The antitypical day of atonement is the most solemn in the universe. It says, in the last vision given me, the prophet says, I was shown the startling, not fiction, but the startling what? Fact. Now, what does it mean when it says startling? What does startling mean? Something that shakes us up. Something that seems like it could not be true. Well, but, but, but if it says a fact, it means that it cannot be proven wrong. Now, watch what God showed the startling fact. That, what was the startling fact, prophet? That but a what? Small portion of those who now profess the truth will be sanctified by it and be what? Saved. What startling fact did you see that just a small portion? That's what Jesus said. The testimony of Jesus just says the same thing. Whatever the prophet says, the Bible says. And whatever the Bible says, the prophet says. It says, why? Many will go above the... In other words, do you know that the reason why we're not going to be saved is because it's so complicated? Do you know that to be saved is very simple? Get to know Jesus. That's simple. But my brothers and sisters, says we go by the simplicity of the word, they will conform to the world, cherish idols, and become spiritually dead. That's why we need a revival. It says the humble, self-sacrificing followers of who? Jesus. They're going to be brought somewhere. They're going to pass on to what? Perfection, like we studied last night. Leaving behind the indifferent and lovers of the world. But that's not the majority. Only a small portion are going to have that experience. Now, how small is that portion going to be? Watch what the prophet says. She says, I was pointed back to what? Now, I want you to understand what the prophet did. Now, I blackened that out. Don't worry about that. I did that. Now, my brothers and sisters, she said, but, but a small portion, God showed her a startling fact. Now, then she said that the, the way that I know this, the way God used, he said, what happened to ancient Israel? So, what happened to ancient Israel is an example of what's going to happen in the last days. Am I right? 
on their way from Egypt to Canaan, on their way from slavery or from sin that is slavery onto the promised land or heaven. This is a type, an example, a shadow of the promised land that God has made for us. But now watch. Look what the Bible says in Exodus. What book did I say? We're going to Exodus chapter 12. Let me show you from the Bible. Because everything that prophet says, the Bible says, I want to show you from the, uh, 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 what the prophet says. Now, look what that says. Now, does anybody know how many people left ancient Israel? Uh, uh, left Egypt. How many of the, the Israelites left Egypt on the Exodus? Anybody know how many? Let, let's see what the Bible says. In Exodus chapter 12, look what the Bible says, beginning in verse 37. And when you get there, let me know by saying Amen. In verse 37, the Bible says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. About how many? About how many? 600,000 on foot. These were men besides the children, besides the women. So to my brothers and sisters, if you had 600,000 men, and you add in the women, and then you add in the children, and those Hebrew women were fruitful. Am I right or wrong? I mean, they were popping them out like popcorn. Now, my brothers and sisters, when you look at that, you see several millions left Egypt. But I'm not going to use several millions. Inspiration tells us, err on the side of mercy. So we're going to take 600,000. That's not even close. But we're going to take 600,000 that left Egypt on their way to the promised land, a type of heaven, the heavenly Canaan. Now, my brothers and sisters, of the 600,000 that left, how many actually completed the experience and made it in? Only two. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to just do something very simple. Let's do some math. Now, I love math, and they tell me in Canada you like math too. They tell me, Barry, you're experts in math, so I'm going to test you. Now, what is 10% of 600,000? What is 10% of 600,000? You said 6,000? No, I said, wait a minute now. Don't you pay tithe? Someone says, well, I don't make 600,000. That's all right. It's all right. 60,000. Did 60,000 make it in? Now, go to 1 Corinthians 10. What book did I say? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to make sure you see this in the Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But now question, that means that 10% didn't make it in. What is 1% of 600,000? What is 1%? Talk to me, somebody. 6,000. Did 6,000 make it in? What is 0.01% of 600,000? 600. Did 600 make it in? What is 0.001 of 600,000? 60. Did 60 make it in? What is 0.0001% of uh, uh, 600,000? Did six make it in? That means that over 99% shaken out. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why the prophet says, I was shown the startling fact that but a small portion, how much I was pointing back toward ancient Israel. But two of the adults of that vast army that left Egypt entered the land of Canaan. Their dead bodies were strewn in the wilderness because of their transgressions. The prophet says, look back at ancient Israel, you will know about modern Israel. Now, brothers and sisters, someone says, well, that's the prophet. What does the Bible say? Listen to me. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. What book did I say? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 2. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2 says, And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud, and where else? And in the sea, talking about Moses leading the children of Israel through the Exodus in the Red Sea. Verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust at the evil things. God says, please, don't lust at the evil. You want to understand why? Look at ancient Israel. Verse 10. Look at it says, excuse me, verse 11. Verse 11 says, now not some of these things, but how much? All of these things happen unto them for, what's the next word? In samples. That word in sample comes from the Greek word tupos. It means type. That everything that happened in ancient Israel is a type. It's an example. It's a shadow. Now, look what it says. It says it's an example of what? It goes on to say an example, and they are written not for them, but they are written for our admonition, our instruction, our warning. And it says, upon whom the ends of the world is come. Who is that? That's us. That what happened to ancient Israel is a type for the final generation. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at what this says. In that type, not even 1% of the people of God made it in, the professed people. 
Do you think we need to wake up? Yes or no? Now, my brother and sister, this says modern Israel are in greater danger. In other words, it's meaning that we will be less prepared than ancient Israel of forgetting God. And any time a nation forgets God, they're about to go under. And being led into idolatry than was this ancient people, many idols are worshipped even by professed what? Sabbath keepers, even by us. And while seven Adventists are thinking, reaching the world, God is saying, somebody needs to reach us. There needs to be a revival and reformation among us. This is why these meetings are here. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is about to come. And I'm going to tell you something. The greatest thing that you and I can study is the plan of redemption. You see, the plan of redemption shows us Jesus. It shows us how to have a relationship with Jesus. It shows us his love. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we understand that plan, we'll be ready. Because we'll know Jesus as a close and intimate and personal friend. And so there are many things to study in that plan. But there are only two things that are essential. How many? Two. Now, last night we talked about what it was. I want to see if you remember what they were. Go to John chapter 9. In fact, go to Ecclesiastes. What book did I say? Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Tell me something. What was the two great things in the sanctuary, the greatest thing in the sanctuary that we should study? Huh? Now, please don't get scared on me tonight. Please talk to me, somebody. Talk to me. Listen, how are we going to reach the community if we can't talk to each other? What were the two great things before the Lamb? Now, that is the word, but we're talking about what are the two great things we should study in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary, I heard someone else say it. In the sanctuary, we should study what? Now, please, did we bring our Bibles? Now, listen, if you brought a cell phone and not a Bible, you're not preparing to get ready. You should be ashamed to stand up with a cell phone and not a Bible. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to see anyone by the grace of God coming here without Bibles. Do you know, I promise you, if we don't take our Bibles with us, we'll never be ready for the coming of the Lord. It's the word of God. We're ashamed that now we think we're cool walking with iPads. It's a shame to see a minister stand on the pulpit and all he's using is an iPad and doesn't even show the Bible. He doesn't even open up the Bible one time. But this is modernism. This is what is modern revivals. But those ancient revivals look totally different. Those ancient revivals, they went back to the Bible, to the word of God. It was to the scrolls. You gave Jesus an iPad and said, no, give me a scroll. And he opened up the page and showed what the truth was. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that while there are many things to study in the sanctuary, there are two that are essential. You see, God is trying to wake us up. And to wake up means, number one, if I'm awake, it means, number one, I know the time. If I'm awake, it means, number two, I understand the work that's to be done in that time. And then number three, understanding the time and the work allows me to sense my need because I see the work cannot be done without Jesus. See, when I see how little time we have and what needs to be done, I say, Jesus, I can't do it. And Jesus said, you're right, you can't. That's why, come to me. The work of redemption is not the work of the sinner. It's the work of Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why God is trying to, excuse me, is trying to show us where we are. He's trying to show us this crisis. Now, look at this. We found out that there were two things. I saw that there was a, look at the last sentence. I saw there was a great work to do for them and but what? And but what? Little time and what should we do it? So we saw the two great things that are essential is the great work, what else? And little time. The time of redemption and the work of redemption. Question, is that the two things that Jesus focused on? Yes or no? How do I know that's the two things that Jesus focused on? Does the Bible say so? Where in the Bible would I show that those were the two main subjects that Jesus spoke on? I know he preached the time is fulfilled. We saw that in Mark 1, but where do we see those two placed together? In John 9. Let's go there quickly. John chapter 9. We'll come back to Ecclesiastes. Go to John chapter 9. Let's go there together. John chapter 9. You know it's a wonderful thing when everything you believe is in the Word of God. You don't have to make it one thing. Let me tell you something. All Seventh-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. We don't have to force people to become seven Adventists. All we have to do is make a man see the beauty of Christ and the Word of God. And any man that will believe in Jesus and the Word of God will eventually be led to this message. Why? This is the religion of the Bible. Not because I say so. We can study the Bible for ourselves. We don't have to make up one word. Notice what the Bible says. What book did I tell you to go to? John chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter 9, beginning in verse 4. Are you there? Amen? Let's read that together. The Bible says, I must work the works of him that sent me when? While it is day. Why, Jesus? The night cometh when? What? No man can. He said, I must work while it is day time. Why? Because the night time cometh when no man can work. Jesus was focused on two things. Great work. Little time. Then if we are Christians, if we are followers of Jesus, what should we be focused on? Two things. Great work. What else? Little time. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, then tonight, that's what we should be focused on. Look at what it says. What is this great work? Go to John 4. John 4. Just back up a few chapters. Go to John 4. Notice what Jesus was interested about in the work. Notice what Jesus was interested about in the work. In John chapter 4, notice what the Bible says. Are you there? Amen. Verse 34. You remember Jesus talking to the woman at the well, and when his disciples left, they couldn't believe it. And then in verse 34, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is what? Talk to me, somebody. Is to do the will of him that sent me. And what else? And to finish. What else? His work. What was on Jesus' mind? The work. That's the issue. That's the real issue. That's the inside of the puzzle of redemption. Yes, there are limits, little time, but the inside is this work. We must understand this work. Do you remember this so much that this idea of finishing the work, take control of Jesus, that from the beginning of his ministry to the end of his ministry, his whole mind was, I must finish the work. You remember in John 17, that last prayer, just before Gethsemane, he said, I must fi- I finish the work that thou gavest me to do. And then he went to the cross. And Jesus was so possessed with this spirit of finishing the work that he would not let his head bow on the 14th day of the first month, Abib, on Passover and die on the cross. He would not let his head die until he could say to his father, it is finished. And the world does not understand that. The only ones that can understand that cry, you've got to go into the plan of redemption. You've got to go into the sanctuary and you will find, my brothers and sisters, that what he meant was that his first work was done. But when his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest had what? Just begun. So my brothers and sisters, we find out that what we need to focus now is what is this work? We spend a lot of time on the time of redemption and we found out what it is. What is the time of redemption? Talk to me. You know it now. What is the time of redemption? The whole time of redemption. What is the time? 7,000 years. Praise God. You got it. But my brothers and sisters, we found 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven, that the sixth feast must be finished by the limit of 6,000 years. The seventh feast of tabernacles in heaven for 1,000 years when it's finished, Eden lost. Because the head of the serpent is crushed, becomes Eden restored. But my brothers and sisters, we looked at this is what we believe. The seven heaven, as you know, that every seven heaven is used to believe what I'm teaching you. Until we lost our identity. But God wants us to go back and get it back. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's the time. We'll come back to that because before we close, we have to find out how close are we to that. We're going to see that tonight by the grace of God. But now, my brothers and sisters, tonight, we want to go back to understand more of this work. We haven't spent enough time there yet. We've got to understand the work a little bit better. And so we're looking now at this work of redemption. Now, what is more important, the time or the work? Are they both important, yes or no? Jesus focused on both of them, both essential. But which one is more important of the essential, time or work? Work, praise the Lord. Why? Go to Ecclesiastes. I told you I'll come back. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I want us to see some Bible. Please look at your Bible. I want you to see this. If you don't have a Bible, please pick one up from the pew. Sit next to somebody. Make sure you can see it for yourself. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, look what the Bible says. Oh, the Bible is good, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in verse 1, to everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose. So the time is for a purpose. What purpose? Verse 17. Ecclesiastes 3, 17. It says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Why? What does the Bible say? For there is what? A time there for every purpose and for every work. So the time is for the work. Does it make sense? And when you make something for somebody else, that's more more important. Who is more important, man or the Sabbath? Man, because man was made, the Sabbath was made for man. God cares about us, brothers and sisters. He loves us. He doesn't want us to be lost. And so we've got to understand this work of salvation. We've got to understand this work of salvation. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at this for a moment. This says that the work of redemption, we looked at it last night, were brought to view to us with two symbols. In the sanctuary, God takes all the words and condenses them into two symbols, two symbols to explain the work of redemption. What is the two symbols that explain the work of redemption? One is the lamb and the other is the priest. Now, who does the lamb represent? Jesus. 
the Lamb of God. Who does the priest represent? Jesus, our great high priest. And so my brothers and sisters, all of the work centers in Jesus. He is the one who does the work from beginning to end. Someone says, well, how could there be three places? What are the three places of the sanctuary? Outer court, what else? Holy place, what else? Most holy place. How could it be three works or three places, but only two works? Remember what we saw last night? The work of the outer court is the work of the lamb. The work of the holy place is the work of the priest. The work of the most holy place is the work of the priest. So we can see the lamb and the priest, two works. Now, what did the lamb work represent? When Jesus as a lamb, what work did he do? Because remember on the cross as a lamb, he died on the cross as the lamb, the Passover lamb, and said, it is finished. What work was finished in 31 AD at the cross? What work was finished? Talk to me, somebody. The work of God paying the price so that we could be bought. Was that in the Bible? Where in the Bible can I find that? Leviticus. What chapter in Leviticus? Let's go there quickly. I just want to lay, lay this down for again. Leviticus chapter 25. Notice what the Bible says in Leviticus 25. Let's go there quickly. Leviticus 25. We saw the Bible is revealing this inside the plan of redemption. The Bible is showing us this. Notice what it says in Leviticus 25. Let's go back there. Leviticus 25. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Leviticus chapter 25. Let me go a little further. Beginning in verse, what verse do we find it in? Verse what? 51. Let's read verse 51 together. Verse 51. It says in verse 51. Let's read that together. You there? Amen? amen. What does verse 51 say? If there be yet many years behind, according to them, he shall give again the what? Price of what? The price of his redemption out of the money that he was what? Out of the money that he was bought for. We found out that the first work of redemption that man was bought. Did Jesus pay the price on Calvary? He did. Do you know, brothers and sisters, without this, nothing else would matter. What is the second part of redemption? Man must be what? Brought. Is there a difference between being bought and brought? Yes or no? Think about this for a moment. In verse 55, it says, For unto me, the children of Israel's servants, they are my servants whom I not bought, that's not what it says this time, but whom I what? Brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now I want to look at this. I want you to see this. Now, the first 4,000 years of human history, Jesus was arranging the purpose, purchase of redemption for the first 4,000 years. Up into the cross, from the time Adam and Eve sinned, up into the cross, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. For 4,000 years, Jesus was arranging the purchase of redemption for you and I, for the universe. Someone says, well, why would it take so long? I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. What if you were driving in Canada and you saw a house that you wanted? And it was a nice house. And the house had a price tag. When you looked at the price tag, that the house said $5 million. Someone says, well, I turn around. <laughs> but Jesus couldn't turn around. He loved us too much. And he saw a price tag, not of $5 million, but of infinite price. And it took an infinite life to be sacrificed. No angel could have paid the price because no angel has eternal life. Only Jesus. Only God. Now, my brothers and sisters, but imagine you saw $5 million, but you said, I've got to have it. You know what it would mean? That you would have to arrange to purchase it. Am I right? And as you make arrangements to purchase it, you have to work some time. Am I right? One year's work, would that be enough? Two years' work, would that be enough? You know that a man in his present paycheck, he can sometimes work for 50 years and still not have enough. That's why when you get a house, you know what you call it? A mortgage. Now, you know what the word mortgage means? It comes from the same place we get mortuary. It means until death. That's actually what it means. So that when a person buys a house, it means they will not finish paying for it until they're dead. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus arranged for the purchase of us. And it costs so much. For 4,000 years, he was arranging this purchase. But in 31 AD, he paid the price. This is the gospel. Now, my brothers and sisters, the everlasting gospel, I'm thankful. What do you say? Does it make sense why it took so long? Yes or no? 
Now, my brothers and sisters, but once he bought us, that wasn't the end. That was just the beginning. After he bought us, now imagine someone says, well, I want to decorate that house of $5 million. Now, that's not the decoration. That's just the house, sister. That's just the house, brother. That's, that's not decorating the house. It has no furniture in it yet. Now, can you imagine? You see that $5 million house, no furniture in it, no bed, no, no uh, tables, nothing, no furniture whatsoever. <laughs> I'm thinking about something, but that's all right. Now, li- listen to me, brothers and sisters. When that happens, what if somebody says, well, I don't have the money yet, but I want to start decorating it? You know what the owner says? No, sir. <laughs> you don't start putting things in until it's what? Until it's paid for. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that Jesus could not start restoring us and perfecting us to the condition that he wanted until the purchase was made? Now, my brothers and sisters, then he can bring us. Where does God want to bring us? Look at what it says. Let's go to Hebrews. What book did I say? Hebrews chapter 6. Go to Hebrews 6. Where does God want to bring us in that sanctuary? He wants to bring us where Jesus is, but Jesus is not in the outer court. He's not in the holy place. Where is Jesus? Talk to me, somebody. In the most holy place. He wants to bring us to Jesus in the most holy place. But to get in there, something must happen to our life. In fact, education page 15, it says, let's read this together. It says, to restore in man the image of his maker to bring him back to the perfection. Bring him back where? Where? To perfection. So where is man to be brought back to perfection in which he was created to promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized this was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. What is the object of life? To be brought back to perfection. Did God make us perfect? Yes or no? You know, I remember I told you there's a new theology in all the churches and in the even inter- now some of that wine of Babylon into the remnant church that says that we can never be brought back to perfection. That we can never stop sinning. We'll be sinning until Jesus comes. Man says he's so sinful that even the power of Christ can't bring us back. But I want to ask you, what sin is more powerful than Jesus? There's not one, brothers and sisters. Jesus is powerful. And Jesus is trying to show us how to be brought back to this condition. God is telling us, is there, it, says, it, is, it says that Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. It is these excuses that lead to what? Sin. There is no excuse for what? Do you know what the prophet told us in the book, little book called Great Controversy? You have the book. The prophet says that Satan deceives the followers of Christ with the fatal sophistry that it is impossible for them to overcome. Once we believe that, we won't even try my brother and sister, but inspiration says, he who does not abhor himself cannot understand the meaning of, remember the work of redemption is to bring us back to perfection. Well, what does it mean? Let's read this together. To be redeemed means, what's the next four words? If I am redeemed, what is the final result? What is the final result of righteousness by faith and the redeeming power of God? What is, it, what is the final result? To what? Cease from sin now is that in the bible yes or no someone says oh you were reading the old testament but 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 that's not that's not in the bible let me show you in the bible hebrews 6 verse 1 hebrews 6 verse 1 you're there amen everything that prophet says the bible says it says therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on let's mature develop develop where unto what perfection someone says that's impossible i'm only human Remember what we said? If we're only human, we're not Christian. Why? You know it takes the power of Jesus to bring us back to perfection. Jesus wants to bring us back to perfection. Now, I want to show you by the grace of God that this is the plan of redemption. What is the first part? Man must be what? Bought. What is the second part? Man must be what? Brought back to perfection where he has victory over every sin. Every sin. Now, my brothers and sisters... Do you know that in order to be brought back to biblical perfection, sin must be taken away. Remember, biblical perfection is very simple. You don't get it caught up in the scholarly, uh, uh, philosophical, intellectual drama. You can get very simple. See, we go above the simplicity of the truth, and that's why we're not brought to Christ and perfection. It's simple. Now, my brothers and sisters, remember we found out, is God perfect? Yes or no? He said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We talked about this last night. When God made us, he made us in his image if God is perfect and we're made in his image then when we were made we were perfect 
Did something mar our perfection? Only one thing. What marred our perfection? Sin. So then in order to bring us back to biblical perfection, he has to be able to remove sin that messed us up. Does that make sense? So biblical perfection is the taking away of all sin. Remember, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the work of the Lamb. Now, sin, in order to be brought back to perfection, must be taken from three places. How many places? Three. Three and only three. If we're going to be brought back to biblical perfection, sin must be taken from three places. Number one, it must be taken from the books of record. You know, every time we sin, an angel records it. And this is why, you know, we're told that even our children and adults should learn this. You know, sometimes we think we're sneaking, getting away from somebody, but you know that there's someone who watches everything. And not to kill us, to destroy us, he's keeping a record hoping that he can save us. Now, my brothers and sisters, God records everything in the book of record, and in the judgment, those books are going to be open. And so if we're going to go through and stand in the judgment in the last generation and be saved through redemption, sin must be taken, number one, from the books of records, cleansed, blotted out. Number two, sin must be taken from the heart of the believer. You know, it's not enough just to take sin from the record. You see, just changing records doesn't change lives. You say, what do I mean? You know what a thermometer is? Anybody know what a thermometer is? What is a thermometer? It's a record of temperature. Am I right? Imagine I'm in Canada. Look, I don't know how you stay here. I don't know how you do it. I don't like being in cold like you do. In Canada, you have to like cold to be in Canada. So, so I don't like it. But somehow you made like you, made, you were made to like it. I don't know. The moment I got outside, I'm saying, Lord, please keep it a little bit warm until I get out of here. Then you can let the snow fall. But now my brothers and sisters, listen to me. What if I hated the snow so much that I took the thermometer off the wall and I broke it? Remember those old thermometers with the mercury in it and the red and the, gold, the line there? And I broke it and all of the mercury comes out and then the line changes and the temperature changes, doesn't it? Does the temperature change outside when I break the record? You know, the mere breaking of records. I remember in a child, you know, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't like school so much when I was growing up. I don't know about you, but I didn't like it so much. Now, I was in public school in the world doing foolishness from here and there. But I remember one time, you know, you get, you used to get your record. I remember you have the friends that would always change. You, they used to have something called uh, uh, midterms. You know, in midterms, they would get the midterm report card. I don't know if they still do that. But the midterm report card, and they would give the report cards. And sometimes what the teacher, uh, what the child would do, he would get an F. But his parents, he said, man, my parents know I got an F. I've been skipping school. I'm in trouble. So he had a way of changing the F into a funny looking A. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Now, some parents are more smart and more, more intelligent, but, but, but today we have a YouTube TikTok brain, and so we get fooled by it. Now, so, so we, we come down, all of a sudden, that, that funny A, we question, did him changing the record of his grades from F to A make him any more intelligent? He's just as dumb as he always was, <laughs> just as foolish as he always was. And do you know that just changing the record in heaven does not convert the sinner on the earth? And so God must not only blot and take away sin from the records, he must take it where? From the heart. You see, my brothers and sisters, every time we sin, not only is it written in the book of records, but Jeremiah says, as the point of a diamond, my sin and iniquity is written on my heart. You know, every time I sin, it's engraved in my brain. Habits are in the brain. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So sin must be taken from the books of record. It must be taken from the heart. And then finally, sin, after it's taken from the heart, must be taken where? From the life. Every day of the life. And then we look like Jesus. We walk like Jesus. Every thought, every word, every action, we reflect his image fully. And if this does not take place, my brothers and sisters, we are not yet redeemed. We may be in the process, but we're not redeemed. Let me show you that from the Bible. First Peter, what did I say? Go to First Peter. Now, I want to show you in just the book of Peter. All of the Bible is explaining the plan of redemption. I want to show you that in just the book of Peter itself, this process is revealed. In First Peter chapter 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. First Peter 1, beginning in verse 18. Let's read that together. First Peter 1, beginning in verse 18. This is the first part of redemption. It says, for as much as you know, don't guess, but you know that you were not redeemed 
with the corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Well, if we're not redeemed with that, how were we redeemed? Verse 19. But with the, talk to me somebody, precious. Is his blood precious, yes or no? The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, how? Without blemish and without spot. That was the lamb. And the work of the lamb was to pay the price so that man could be bought. Do we see that first part? Yes or no? Now, do you know if that part were not done, no other part would matter. To blot the cross out of redemption is like taking the sun out of the sky. It's darkness. Do you know that if a man were to get victory over sin from this day forward, if we were brought back to perfection from this day forward, it would not be enough to enter heaven. Heaven is a pure place. Do you know if we got to the gates of heaven, even with perfection in the final generation, we would get to the gate and the gate, the law would say, you cannot come here. Because the wages of sin, not sins, but the wages of sin, sin singular, one sin is death, eternal death. And do you know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Do you know that it takes, if we say, well, look, Lord, I'm perfect now. I have victory now over all sin. I'm no longer watching foolishness. I'm no longer talking or eating or all of this stuff. Would you get in the back and stop these men from talking out there and kind of bring them back in? An elder can go back and bring them in. We want nothing to distract you. Just bringing everybody on in so we are right, not distract. Now, my brothers and sisters, if that were to take place, do you know that we still could not enter heaven? Why? The law demands a perfect life. From beginning to end. How many sinners have that? Not one. But there is a man that came to this earth in human flesh and lived a perfect life from the cradle to his death and offers to give this life unto us without price. What's his name? Do you like his name? Do you know we need Jesus, every one of us? Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says, but once he's bought us, that's not it. The first work is that man must be brought. The last work, he must be brought. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have what? What's the next two words? We don't have to be afraid of victory over sin. It's the work of Jesus if we let him in. It says we, that men may have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature, and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity, what? Does not commit what? Sin. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what we're told. Now, go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now go to 1 Peter 3. We saw in 1 Peter 1, the lamb bought us. Did we see that in chapter 1? Yes or no? The precious blood. Now, in chapter 3, we're going to see now that he bought us. In chapter 3, we're going to see that he brought us. Look at 1 Peter 3. What book did I say? 1 Peter chapter 3. The whole story in this one book of Peter. 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 18. Let's read that together. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. What does the Bible say? It says, for Christ, that's the man, also have one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might, what's the next word? Bring us to God. In chapter 1, we were bought. In chapter 3, we are brought. In chapter 4, it tells us where he's going to bring us to. Where? Chapter 4. Let's go there. First Peter 4. In First Peter 4, you see the story of redemption. And once you understand the picture, you see the whole Bible. makes sense. In First Peter 4, verse 1, let's see where God is going to bring us. Chapter 1, bought. Chapter 3, brought. Where, Peter? Chapter 4, verse 1 says, For as much then as Christ has suffered, where? For us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise. How? With the same mind. In other words, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It says, for he that has suffered in the flesh have, what's the last three words? Ceased from sin. Now, my brothers and sisters, what's the story? Chapter one, bought. Chapter three, brought. Brought where? Back to perfection, to a place where we cease from sin. Is that what the Bible says? Yes or no? Is that the exact words of the prophet? Cease from sin. My brothers and sisters, everything that prophet says, the Bible says. 
God is bringing us back to the place through redemption where we can see from sin. This is the work of redemption. This is what must happen by the end of the day of atonement. Is God going to get somebody ready? Yes or no? Let's read it together. Everyone who believes on Christ, even though 99% may be shaken out, here is a ratio of 100% if we have Jesus. Everyone who believes on Christ, everyone who relies on the keeping power of a risen Savior, that has suffered the penalty pronounced upon the transgressor, everyone who resists temptation and in the midst of evil copies the pattern given in the Christ life, will through, talk to me somebody, read that with me, it says through what? Not faith in themselves, but faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ become a partaker of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption of the world through lust. Then it says, let's read it together. We should all put this to memory. What does it say? Everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived. How? Before his transgression. That's the plan of redemption. That's the everlasting gospel. That's the message that Satan hates because when that experience is ours, Jesus can come out of the most holy place and crush the head of Satan. That's the real issue. And so Satan's plan, he cannot stop Jesus from dying on the cross. That work is finished. The final work is to come out of that most holy place and to bring a generation back to perfection. That's what Satan's trying to stop right now. Go to Leviticus 16 as we get ready to look at some of the, the main points tonight. Go to Leviticus 16. What book did I say? Now look at that. What's on the screen now? Look on the screen. What's on the, you go to Leviticus 16, but look on the screen. What's on the screen? Now, see, most of the world does not know this because we don't understand the game. But if you understood the game, it would make sense. You know, if you didn't know football, it would seem strange. Can you imagine a person playing football? They have one. They play with a little pig skin and they throw the pig skin around. First person gets the pig skin. He starts running, trying to get into the end zone. If he doesn't make it, that ball that he's diving for, trying to catch and get, he takes it and kicks it to the other person. And the person says, if he never saw football before, he'll say, why in the world is he kicking it back? He was just running all over for it and back and forth, back and forth. But something happens at halftime. Anybody know anything about halftime in football, especially in NFL? Anybody know anything about halftime? What happens at halftime? Of the, some of the greatest shows. You know that a man, a commercial on halftime is the most expensive commercial in the entire world. A person will sometimes pay two million American dollars for 30 seconds because he knows that the entire world, the majority of the world, is watching it. And so my brothers and sisters, the halftime show, do you know that some of the so-called greatest celebrities perform at the halftime show? You know, a different one, you have the, a big show at halftime coming out. And all of a sudden you come in and person starts singing, dancing, rapping. Then you start person to come in. This was, a, this was the halftime show from this year. I didn't see it, but this is what they say. You know who that is. Now, now how do you know who that is? You in trouble. <laughs> Now, my brothers and sisters, performing at halftime, performing. If you did not understand the game, do you know that most people would think, well, man, that's such great excitement. They don't do that at the end of the game. The game must be over. But it's not over. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that in 31 AD, it was halftime? The first half of redemption was done. The cross, the bought. But there's still another half. Man must be brought back to perfection. Now, my brothers and sisters, but the entire evangelical world, except for a little remnant called Seven Half Minutes, believe that the game is over. And guess what? People are beginning to go home thinking it's over. But there's one denomination that has a message that says it's not over. Satan can still win the game. Do you know that if a person, if the other team actually left the game at halftime, they will be disqualified. And the other team that remains would win by default. Do you know that if Jesus cannot produce a generation that has victory over sin, then Satan will win by default and the universe will be given into his hand. It's only half time and no other body knows this but us. And this is why Satan is wrath with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed to destroy this message. But God is going to have a people that will come back to the original message God gave us in 1844. We've got to go back to the roots of our message, brothers and sisters. Now you're going to find this halftime. This is the work of redemption. We found out this work must be brought, must be bring us back to perfection. We saw that it's going to bring us to a place where we can have victory over sin. We saw, brothers and sisters, what would happen if God could not bring us back to perfection. Now I can't take too long here. I wanted to stay here for long. I mean, mean, this thing is deep. This is deep. I I can only stop here for a moment because we have a little more ground to cover before we close. Are you going to hang with me? Are you ready? 
Esther. Uh, let's go to Psalms 9. Go to Psalms 9. Now, my question is, what would happen? Go to Psalms 9. What would happen if God cannot bring us back to perfection? Because many people say God cannot bring us back to perfection. You know, many people teach that when Jesus comes back the second time, he's going to, at the twinkling of an eye, change us, and that's what he's going to give us victory over sin. No, he changes the body, but he doesn't change the mind at that time. The character is what we take from this earth to the next, the relationship that we have with God. But let's see what would happen. You remember what we read last night? The history of the world in the Garden of Gethsemane came up before the world's Redeemer. You remember we read where it said the world's unfalling, the heavenly angels have watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close. They watched intently this great crisis and the work of redemption. But remember, redemption has three places. So the same thing that would have happened if he failed in phase one would happen if he failed in phase two or in phase three. Remember that? It's only one plan, brothers and sisters. Only one plan. Now, I want us to see something for a moment. Now, you remember we talked about this very thing. It says, how much was at stake? Everything was at stake with him. Everything was at stake. Look what it says. So, what would happen if he failed? You're in Psalms 9. Are you there? Look what the Bible says in Psalms 9. Psalms 9, verse 15. Let's read that together. Psalms 9 and verse 15. Are you there? Amen. Amen. Let's read that together. In verse 15, what does the Bible say in verse 15? It says, he made, in Psalms 9, 15 says, he made a pit. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Psalm 7, excuse me, Psalm 7. Thank you. Psalm 7, thank you. Psalm 7, and it sounds like you're studying now. Praise the Lord. So if I said that to you the first day, you would just read on with me. But in Psalm 7, look what it says. Psalm 7, verse 15. Let's read that together. The Bible says, he made a what? Pit and digged it. And is fallen into the ditch which he made. Now, remember, every verse explains the plan of redemption. Something's happening. Does anybody understand what that's saying? Anybody know what that's saying? What's that telling me? Don't be afraid. Tell me. What's that saying? He made a pit and what? Digged it. And falleth into the ditch which he made. What's that saying? You can speak speak out loud. We're in the class. You can speak out loud. That he dug his what? He dug his own grave. Now, I want you to understand specifically, he dug his own grave. Now, I want you to understand what they're saying. Look what it says in verse 16. His mischief shall return upon what? His own head. Remember, I'm going to, he's going to crush his head. It's upon his own head. And his violent dealing shall come down upon what? His own pate. The pate is the crown of the head. So, my brothers and sisters, we're telling us that exactly what he's trying to do to God is what's going to happen to himself. You understand? I want to make sure you understand that principle. Now, let's go to Esther chapter 9. I'm, you, you'll see it better from here. Let's go to Esther 9. Go to Esther chapter 9. I want to make sure you see this. This is deep, brothers and sisters. Not because I say so, because the thoughts of God are deep. Look at Esther chapter 9. Go there quickly. Esther chapter 9. Does anybody remember the story of Esther? Because what's happening today is very similar. Anybody remember Esther chapter 9? Who was the enemy in Esther chapter 9? Who was the enemy? Haman, Haman was the enemy. Now, young man, you're not going to be able to keep talking like that. Amen. Esther chapter 9. Who was the enemy? Haman, am I right? Now, what happened at the end? Was he trying to destroy the the, the people of God? Yes or no? And as he tried to destroy the people of God, who was the main man he wanted to destroy? Mordecai. How did he plan to destroy Mordecai? He planned to put him, he hanged him on the gallows. And so he had a gallow made. Am I right? Now, did Haman die anyway? Did Haman get thrown into a lion's den? Why not? Go to Esther chapter 9. Are you there? Amen. Now remember, every verse is really explaining the plan of redemption. Now my young sister, I'm going to have to, tonight, I'm not going to be able to let you do that tonight. Amen. Even if we have to move, but but, but Father, you can't let that happen tonight. This is too serious. Now, Esther chapter 9. Thank you, sister. Esther chapter 9. Look what the Bible says in Esther chapter 9. In Esther chapter 9, look what the Bible says in Esther 9. Are you there? Amen. Look what it says, beginning in verse 24. Watch it now, 24. Esther 9, beginning in verse 24. Look what the Bible says in Esther 9, verse 24. Are you there? Let's read it together. It says, because Haman, the son of Hamathithi, the Agathite, the enemy of what? All the Jews have devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast per, that is the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But notice verse 25. 
Let's read that together. The Bible says, but when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that the wicked device which he devised against the Jews should return, talk to me somebody, upon his own head. Then the Bible says, upon his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged where? On the gallows. So the thing that he did to, to try to do to the, to, to, to the people of God, that exact thing backfired and happened to himself. Now, so if you want to know what would happen to Jesus and God if the plan of redemption is lost, all you have to do is look at what happens to Satan as he loses the plan of redemption. You understand what I'm saying? Because what he was trying to do to God is going to happen to himself. Are you understanding? So what is the thing that happens to Satan? What is the end of the day of atonement? The goat? Go to Leviticus 16. What book did I say? Go to Leviticus 16. You know the end. The end, the goat is taken where? Talk to me, somebody. The goat is laid where? In the wilderness. And is left to die there. How? Who's with him? Who's with him? Uh-uh. The fit man takes him there, but the fit man doesn't stay with him. What happens? He's left desolate and alone all by himself until he dies. Do you know that Satan's plan, if, if, if God would have lost, do you know what would happen, brothers and sisters? If God would have lost, we're going to find that God would have allowed us to have to go into the hands of Satan forever. But the wages of sin is what? Do you know that man could not live forever? The devil is not eternal. Eventually, the devil would have died. Eventually, mankind would have died. And God, because he's fair and will do right, even if no one else looks at him. See, you and I, if we do something wrong, if somebody's not looking at us, we do something different. But God is not like that. God is the same yesterday, forever. You know what he did? He would have left the world in an uninhabitable condition and would have never been involved in no other act of creation. And God, all alone, for the rest of eternity, would have been by himself. A depressed being. But I praise God. That will never happen. You know why? Because Jesus is going to produce a people that are victorious over every sin. My brothers and sisters, look what it says. Desire of ages 36, the deception of sin had reached its height. All the agencies of depraving the souls of men have been put in operation. The Son of God, looking upon the world, beheld suffering and misery. With pity, he saw how men had become what? Victims of satanic torment. I mean, look at it now. You know that we are in a generation where grandchildren are being molested by granddads. Grandfathers molesting children. Look at the adultery and the fornication and the killing and the stealing. It's terrible. God hates it, brothers and sisters. It says, he looked with compassion upon those who were being corrupted, murdered, and lost. They had chosen a ruler who had chained them to his car. Talking about the train as a captive. Bewildered and deceived, they were moving on in gloomy procession where? Toward what? Eternal ruin. To death in which is no hope of life. Toward night to which comes what? No morning. It says, satanic agencies were incorporated with men. The bodies of human beings made for the dwelling place of God have become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, the passions, the organs of men, even the organs were being used by Satan were worked by supernatural agencies in the adulterance of the violence of lust. Now, I don't have time, but that violence of lust, she's talking about homosexuality. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenances of men. Human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil which they were possessed. Do you know that God knows every demon by name? He knows every characteristic. He's like a child. You know when you have a child? You know every characteristic of the child. Do you know that every demon, you know when we're sinning, a demon uses and impresses us to sin. Do you know that Jesus can see the very demon of the particular one he made that's impressing us? And he says, man, that's that one lost soul that I had, that one lost angel. And look what he's doing now. He sees the multiplication of sin all over the world. It says... Human faces reflect the expression of the legion of the evil which they were possessed. Such was the prospect upon which the world's redeemer looked. What a spectacle for infinite purity to what? Behold. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that Jesus, the world thought that he was going to leave this world into Satan. But instead of giving this world to the devil, Jesus died to redeem it. What a God. God is saying, please wake up. Look at 1 Corinthians. I'm coming back to Leviticus 16. We'll come there in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 
Please, dear God, as we bring these final minutes, as we are studying in these final minutes, please help us. Please give us more of your spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you something. Jesus is good. Is he good, brothers and sisters? Look what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 15, look what the Bible says. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, the Bible is good. And you know that the television is just a cheap imitation. This is the real drama. You know, a man, when man's in the football game, he gets excited. Rawr! He's shouting up and down basketball. He's shouting up and down. And then he comes to church and he can't say anything. Oh, yes, God is good. Praise the Lord. Inspiration says, if ever there was a time to be excited, it says, poor formalists be excited about redemption. My brothers and sisters, the Bible says very carefully, what book did I tell you to go to? 1 Corinthians 15. You're right with me. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15. Look what the Bible says. Do you know that if God cannot get a sinless generation, then all of this will be in vain. In 1 Corinthians 15, look what the Bible says, verse 14. Here's Paul talking after the cross. Paul, understanding redemption, now after the cross says in verse 14, if Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching what? Vain. And your faith is also what? Vain. But he's just talking about present truth. In other words, he's talking about the part of redemption that was happening right there. That if the cross did not take place, then the faith was vain. If the resurrection did not take place, our faith is vain. If his work in the holy place and not taking faith, our faith is vain. If his work in the most holy place is not finished, our faith is in vain, my friends. It was only halftime. But now we're in the final quarter. Can you imagine a man? Here's basketball. How many quarters does basketball have? Four. Can you imagine a man? He's down by ten. And his teammate comes to him to, to encourage him. He said, I know we're down by 10. There's only a few seconds left, but don't worry. We'll get them in the sixth quarter. <laughs> you say, sixth quarter? The final quarter is the fourth. And someone said, but how, how could such a man, how can a man like that even be on the team? How is he even a player to be thinking there's a sixth quarter? But you know that right now, you and I, we say, oh, well, God, God will be able to finish the work in another generation. Do you know that there's no more generations? This is the last he must do it now. And this is why somebody says, but there's not a lot of people. Less than 1% God's going to take to take it to the entire world. Now, my brothers and sisters, he's got to make this number up now. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, do you want to wake up? This is why we've got to wake up. This is why the meetings are here now. Look at verse 34. Let me show us what is the real experience if we're really awake. Someone says, I'm awake. Let's see if we're awake. 1 Corinthians 15. Are you there? Amen. Verse 34. Let's read 34. 34 says, awake, wake up to righteousness. And sin not. So if I'm still sinning, guess what? I'm not awake. I awake to righteousness, and then what happens? I sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Do you know that we're shaming God if we try to tell the world about salvation and we don't allow him to give us victory over the sins in our lives? The evil temper, the appetite, what we watch, look, think. God can give us victory over everything. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is his work in the most holy place. Go to Leviticus 16. Let's close. Let's get ready to bring out some final points and close. Go to Leviticus 16. What book did I say? Now, I believe you understand what we got this, at this point right here. I believe we see what would happen. If Jesus does not come out of that most holy place in time, the head of Satan cannot be crushed. We know that the crushing started at the cross, but did it finish there? Yes or no? When does it finish? On the day of atonement. Let's go to Leviticus 16. Are you there? Amen? Amen. Now, the whole chapter, you read this in your homework, is for the day of atonement. But I want to come to the end of the day. What verse would I look at to go to the end of the day of atonement? Because the head of Satan will not be crushed until the end of the day of atonement. And it has to finish on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, where would I go in the Bible in Leviticus 16? The whole chapter starts with the beginning of the day to the end of the day. What verse would take me to the end of the day of atonement in type? What verse? Verse 20. Now, someone says, how do you know that? Well, let's read it. Let's see. Leviticus 16, verse 20. Let's read verse 20. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 20 together. Are you, let's read that. It says, and when he hath made and... So we know it's at the end because that's what the Bible says. Am I right? When he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, that is the most holy, and the tabernacle of the congregation, that is the holy place, and the altar, that's the altar of incense in the holy place, he shall bring the live goat, and the goat represents who? Who's it represent? Satan. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay what? I wonder why both his hands. Why not one? 
That's a whole other story. I can't get there now. Lay both his hands upon the... Now, now listen, listen. I want to make sure we're together. We need, we need this. The Bible says that Satan shall lay both his hands upon the... The priest, excuse me. The priest shall lay both his hands upon the head of the scapegoat. This is the work. This is finishing the work. Now, my brothers and sisters, why the head? Why not the tail? Why not the back? Why not rub the belly of the goat? Why the head? Now, talk to me. Anybody can talk. Talk to me now. Because God declared the in from the beginning and the first thing the real issue is the crushing of satan's head he's saying that head that i started bruising when i bought you at the cross and galgotha the place of a skull that skull that i started crushing at calvary is going to be finished on the day of atonement when the priest comes out and puts the sin on the head of the scapegoat but brothers and sisters he has to have guess how much sin to do that all of the sin now, my brothers and sisters, this is a type, this is a shadow, and it must be fulfilled as to the event and as to the time. Now, in the event, we see three things. Because sin must be removed from the books of record, from the heart, and from the life. Now, notice what it says in Leviticus 16, verse 21. Let's read it carefully now. It says, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess. Notice he's going to say three things. Would you say it with me? We're going to read verse 21. And confess over him all, not some, but what? All their iniquity. What else? All their transgression. What else? All their sin. Three things. All their iniquity, all their transgression, all their sin. Three places sin must be removed from, from the record, from the heart, and from the life. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is iniquity? Known sin. What is transgression? Sin is the transgression of the law. What is sin? Sin. All Jesus is trying to make plain. I don't know how much he can make it more plain. All sin will be gone. Now, my brothers and sisters, if Jesus has taken all sin, how much is the church of God left with? How much is the congregation left with? So then what are they at the end of the day of atonement? Sinless. So the final generation... In order for Jesus to leave the most holy place and crush the head of Satan must be a sinless generation. Are you understanding? That's the type. That's the shadow. So there must be, that was an example, but God must do the real thing through the blood of the real Christ. It only did it in shadow in the ancient sanctuary service. It didn't really happen. It was just a shadow. Those blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. It couldn't make the man perfect. But the real blood of Jesus brings us back to perfection. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know that this is a serious thing because we're not yet sinless. And if the limit comes and we're not sinless, then Satan wins. Do you know that Jesus is counting on us? Now, normally a team puts the best players in at the end of the game. If a team's been up and then they go down and there's a few seconds left, the team put their best players in. Starting five. Whoop, they put them come back in. But you know what happens? In this final generation, Jesus puts the weakest generation on the field. The least generation. The weakest physically. The weakest mentally. The weakest spiritually. And says, I'm going to make that generation get victory over sin. And then the glory will not go to man. The glory goes to the man, Christ Jesus. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. God is going to have a people and this message must go to every denomination, must go to all the world in this generation. But we don't know that message anymore. God has to bring us back. This is why he says, wake up and sin not. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is trying to do this for us, and we don't have much time. We want to get ready to close by finding out how much time we have left. Can we do that? How much time we have left? Now, my brothers and sisters, you saw this. We know the condition of the sea was a sinless generation. This is where he must bring us back to. Inspiration tells us this, that we're living in the last few moments. I'm going to pass on that. You know it must happen on time. Inspiration tells us something. Inspiration tells us this. It says, for 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. What's the next word? 
now all have made their decisions when at the end of 6,000 years. Then it says the wicked have fully united himself, united with Satan in his warfare against God when at the end of what? 6,000 years. Then it says the time has come. So at the end of 6,000 years, the time has come for something in the sanctuary. You studied it with me last night. I want to make sure you got that. I'm reviewing this to deepen our impression. What time comes at the end of 6,000 years? Talk to me, please. I have faith in you tonight. Please, somebody help me. Please, my sister, please help me. Please, my brother, please, somebody help me. What time has come? Think about it. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. What is the issue? What is the issue? What is the issue? Talk to me. So then, what time has come at the end of 6,000 years? A showdown. It, listen, I can't go to it now, but you remember, and, and, and remember the great fight, the great conflict between David and Goliath? This is what it was really about. That one fight could decide the entire battle. Now, my brothers and sisters, you remember David, the, the Goliath, big giant, Goliath? You remember David? How many sons did Jesse have? Seven. And David was the, uh, the uh, seven sons before David. Do you know that David was the last son? He represents the last generation. He was the smallest, the youngest, the weakest, and God took that last little generation and defeats the giant. Amen. That one battle. The time has come for Jesus to come out of the most holy place and crush the head of Satan. That's the issue that the whole universe is waiting on. My brothers and sisters, the 6,000 years of work of sin is there. At the end of 6,000, the time has come. The time has come for what? The time has come for Christ to leave that most holy place and put the sin on the head of the scapegoat. But if all sin is not there, he can't come. Satan is trying to stop Jesus from coming out of the most holy place, and Jesus must be there. You know why? Because if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and he forgives us our sins. Do you know that if we're forgiven of sin today, you know what we need in the sanctuary? A priest. If we're forgiven and are saved, see, if there's no priest in the, in the sanctuary and we sin, the wages of sin is death. So in order not to allow us to die, the priest stays up there. But if we sin next year, what must be in the sanctuary if we're going to be saved? A priest. So then when can the priest leave? When we stop sinning. And Satan says, I can't beat Jesus. But if I can keep them sinning, Jesus can never leave. Because he loves them too much. And if the time runs out, he loses the game. This is where we are. And in 2024... The clock is ticking. There's only a few seconds left. You understand what I'm telling you? And we're not ready. Oh God, we're not ready. Please, dear Lord, give us a few more years of grace, Lord. We don't understand. Please help us. Please, Lord. This is no joke. Father, you love us. Please give us a few more years. I beg you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you understood this, we'll be praying, Lord. Give us a little more time. Let me show you. We're going to close. Let me pass on this. You, you understand that? These types have to be refilled on time. Now, who brings the scapegoat into the wilderness? Who brings them? You remember what the fit man means? Remember, I used to think it was strong. I mean, he's exercising in the gym. But that fit man in Hebrew doesn't mean strong. You can look it up yourself. That fit man comes from the word iti. It means what? timely so the fit man means the scapegoat or satan is brought on time so even if we're not ready the scapegoat is coming and if nobody gets victor over sin jesus loses and satan is flattering himself because he sees how much we're still just hooked on television we can't stop hooked on the music of this world hooked on sin we can't stop but I believe that somebody's going to see the love of Jesus so much that we're going to say, Lord, whatever I have to give up, I will give up for you tonight because you love me so much. My brothers and sisters, God is going to have somebody that vindicates his character. Now look what it says. The time has come at the end of 6,000 years. The time for what? Look what it says. The time for what has come. It says, at the coming of Christ, the earth is emptied of his inhabitants. The whole earth appears like a what? Desolate wilderness. That means something. It's coming back on the test. Now the event takes place foreshadowed. 
and the last solemn service of the day of atonement. And then it quotes Leviticus 16, 21. It says, in like manner, when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and in the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan and he will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused them to commit. Let's read it together. And as the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth and unenhabited inhabited and dreary wilderness the revelator foretells the banishment of satan and the condition of chaos and desolation to which the earth is to be reduced and he declares that this condition will exist talk to me somebody for a thousand years six thousand ends on time one thousand starts we're in heaven with jesus as he takes us back for a thousand years six thousand plus one thousand equals seven thousand eden lost becomes eden restored and the whole history of redemption it reaches its limit but these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the, somebody said that was the cross. He died the 14th day, first month, a bit, three o'clock, exactly on time. Jesus, he died on time. He resurrected on time. He went to the holy place on time. He went into the most holy place on time. Will he come back on time? Yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, he's going to come back. Look what it says. In like manner, the types which relate to the second event, and that is when Jesus comes out of the heavenly sanctuary to the outer court, to the earth, that is the end of the day of atonement in type. These types which relate to the second event must be fulfilled at the time. And what is the time? 6,000 years. Now, my brothers and sisters, we need to find out today in 2024, how close are we to the 6,000 year limit? Is your seatbelts on? Are you sitting down? Sit down. All right, let's go. Question, how old is the earth? Do you know that most of the world would agree how old the earth was? Do you know that, do you know that most of the world agreed that the earth is about 6,000 years old? And do you know that everybody agreed upon this until recently? Guess what event that happened that changed this? Now, this is the age of the earth is one of the most contentious issues in creation evolution debate. In today's culture, the thought of creation occurring about 6,000 years ago is frequently mocked by non-Christians and also by many Christians. It's all millions and millions of years. But you know that the world didn't always think like that. That's a new thought. Even James Usher. Well, you ever heard of James Usher? Famous uh, historian and, 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 and religious so-called church father. It says, the famous and respected archbishop of Ireland in the 17th century is today greatly ridiculed for declaring that the world was created in 4004 B.C. However, now interesting enough, he said he believed it was on October 23rd, 4004 B.C. that it started. Interesting. That's another study. However, this date was widely accepted until people begin to believe in an idea such as billions of years. Do you know that until uh, 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 Charles Darwin and evolution in the 1840s, everybody believed that the world was only 6,000 years old? Because if you look at the Bible, you know, you can actually get the age of the earth by the Bible. I remember I took a couple of days when I started studying this. You, you remember you sometimes you say, well, why does the Bible have that in it? You remember the begot? He begot, he begot, he begot, he begot. You know, it starts with Adam, and it says he was this old, and then he died, and this child. And, you know, if you keep doing that down through the ages, you can go that, then you follow into the New Testament. You can follow it. It took me about three days, hour after hour. I took a paper out and just went step by step by step. When I got to the flood, I said, I can't believe this. You remember with the flood? Do you know that the flood occurred 1,656 years after the earth was created? In the first 2,000. You'll find that every 2,000 years, every 2,000 years, a crisis happens of world proportion. First 2,000 years, the world came to an end by flood. The second 2,000 years, the first advent of Christ. Last 2,000 years, second advent of Christ. It's divided in, the, in these three halves. Now, my brothers and sisters, you will find that these times have to be fulfilled on time. Now, do you know that by any historian who understands the dating like we talked about from the Bible, that between 1997 and 2004, the earth reached 6,000 years. Did you hear what I said? By between 1997, depending on your school of thought, between 1997 and 2004, the earth reached 6,000 years old. You know, somebody says, what, minister, evangelist, preacher, you spent all this time telling us of the great work of time and the limit and the border, and then, then you said he does everything on time. How then gets 6,000 years? But remember, this doesn't say 6,000 years of world history. 
6,000 years of sin. But sin did not start the day the earth was created. The clock of 6,000 to bring a limit doesn't start until sin starts. Remember, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, how long could they have lived? Forever. So the world would not have had a limit. Well, what brought a limit? When man did what? Sin. And sin brings a limit. The wages of sin is limit, is death. And so my brothers and sisters, when sin came, that clock started ticking. So then we would have to find not how old the earth is, but how long sin has been on the earth. And so we would have to find out when did Adam sin? So my question is, when did Adam sin? We don't know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You, you, you waiting for me. <laughs> but, but we don't know. You know why? God purposely, because before probation, he would never give us the day and the hour. But he would show us the generation, the generation that shall not pass. Now, I'm going to show us the numbers to the generation that shall not pass. Let's go a little further. Evolution stopped this thing. In 2024, are we close? Do you think so? Let's see. We're going to the sanctuary. Where's the place to go to understand? In the sanctuary. Remember, here is wisdom. Let him that understanding, let him count. You know, in Leviticus 25, in the, in, in the history of redemption, in the Jubilee, they had Jubilees every 50 years and different things like that. When the land was restored and redeemed, do you know that they could actually count how close they were to it? Now, my brothers and sisters, one Jewish year represented this whole plan. Remember, God does in cycles of seven, 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven. We looked at this. We want to get now to the day. We, we don't go to all the cycles of seven. There's many cycles of seven in the Bible. The largest of them is the cycle of 7,000 years. Now, Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies and their two great festivals. He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering that he would thus bring to an end the system of types and ceremonies that for 4,000 years had pointed to his. So when Adam and Eve sinned, the first lamb was killed. Am I right? That was the first time a type and so he said that when Jesus died on the cross, he brought that system of dying lambs to an end. How long? From sin to the cross. About how long? From sin to the cross. We have the outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Most holy place. Now I want you to understand. The whole time from Genesis to Revelation are taken from the outer court to the most holy place. In the outer court, from sin to the cross was, what's that word I put before 4,000? What's that word before 4,000? About 4,000. That's what? I didn't hear you. That was what? Uh, you, you're afraid to talk with me? It, that's a, that was about 4,000. See, God's going to need somebody to give a loud cry very soon. About 4,000 years. Now look at this now. Now, 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 let me test you. Let me test you. You, you, you in Canada, you, you math, you mathematically inclined. Let me help you. Now, from the time man sinned until Jesus died on the cross to finish the work in the outer court was about 4,000 years. Then he went into the holy place. Am I right? What year did he go into the holy place? No, no. Holy place. Holy place. Remember, three places. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. What year did he go into the holy place? Remember, he died on the cross, 31 A.D. He resurrects, goes back to heaven. Where in heaven? Into the what? Holy place, right? So he goes into the holy place. What year? Same year, right? So he goes into the, the, the holy place, 31 A.D. Now, out of court to the cross is about. Every other number after that out of court is exact. No about. Exact. We know exactly from 31 A.D. all the way into what year? All the way into what year did he stay in the holy place? In 1844. So he stayed in the whole place exactly from 31 to 1844. No about exactly. No question. So now my brothers and sisters, how long is that? 31 AD into 1844. How long is that? Put it down on your paper. Please write it down on your paper. Don't, 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 don't take my mind. Put it down on your paper. Write it down. How long is 31 AD to 1844? How long is that? You, you, you're good at math. Talk to me. Throw it out. Spit it out. Praise the Lord. No, not 31. 1813. Remember, 31 A.D., in order to get 44 from 31, you add 1 and 3, then 1,800. So you see, 1,813 years. Is that about or is that exact? 
exact. And we know the exact day that he went in to the holy place and the exact day that he went in to the most holy place. You know, on Pentecost, that's when he started working in the holy place. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. That's why. In October 22nd, 1844, he went into the most holy place. Exactly on that day. When did he come out? He's still there right now. Am I right? So he's been there from 1844. What year are we in now? To 2024. This takes all of time from sin to now. Now, my brothers and sisters, how long is 1844 to 2024? How long is that? Do the math quickly. Write down. Do the math. I heard somebody say 100 what? 180 years. Exact. Not about. Exactly. Exactly. Now, my brothers and sisters, remember there's how much limit? How much limit? 6,000 years. Now, it's not yet 180 years yet. That's the math, but it's not 180 years yet because we're in the spring. So in the, in the biblical year, the year starts in the spring and finishes in the fall. So the Day of Atonement comes in the fall. We're in the spring right now. So we're not going to be 180 years until the fall of this year. You understand what I'm saying? So the fall of this year will be 180 years that Christ has been in the most holy place to the day. Now, what I want you to do is add that up because that's all of the time from the outer court to the present. And tell me which time you get. Add it up. Quickly, add it up. I heard somebody say something. What is that? If you were to add that, how much? About what? About 4,000, right? I add to 4,000. What do I add to it? 1813. That's the work in the holy place. This is the work out of court. Then in the most holy place, what do I add? 100 and what? 80. Let's do it. We all know the math. We do it. Zero, three. I drop my three. I have three. Eight plus one is what? Nine. Eight plus one is what? Nine. Four plus one is what? Am I at 6,000 yet? Am I close? Now, my brothers and sisters, I cannot leave it, though, at 5993 because that is not exact 4,000. That is what? So that means that we are about at 5,993 years, which means about how much years do we have left? About how much? About seven years for the limit, and seven is a, a serious number. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's where Jesus was when he started his public ministry. Seven years. Now, my brothers and sisters, we do that now and we see that. But this is not trying to tell us the exact year or the exact date because, see, God could cut it short. Am I right? The Bible says he can cut it short. So, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says he can cut it short in righteousness, we're told in Hebrews and Romans chapter 9. So, my brothers and sisters, that means that we have about seven years plus or minus this generation now my brothers and sisters watch how do i know in 2024 it's almost 26 look what it says we read that one that was at the cross but now look what this says the story of what bethlehem it is an exhaustive thing now bethlehem is that the death of christ or the birth of christ how much time between the death of christ and the birth of christ some years am i right but it's just generation his life one generation his life is just one generation so now my brothers and sisters, but look at the last sentence. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by what? So here is speaking of Bethlehem, the birth as the 4,000 year period. First the cross, which is later. Here the Bethlehem, which is earlier, showing it's not trying to talk about an exact year. It's talking about the lifespan, the generation, because we cannot know the day and the hour. One saying the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. How near? Even at the door. When is that? Matthew 24 says the generation. So we should know the 6,000 year, not year, but the 6,000 year generation. And that's us. Now, my brothers and sisters, watch it. Look what this says. This says Christ in the wilderness of temptation. Now, when is the wilderness? Birth of Christ or death of Christ or in between? So notice Three different stages, but each given at 4,000. Look what it says. Christ in his wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test. Here, Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf when? 4,000 years after Adam turned his back. Sin. 
So this is showing us 4,000 years at his birth, 4,000 years at, his, at, his, uh, at, at the temptation, uh, 4,000 years at the cross, showing he's not trying to talk about the exact year, but the generation. Jesus was in one generation. It's trying to show us the 6,000-year generation, the generation that would reach 6,000 years. And brothers and sisters, we have about seven years plus or minus. What do I mean by plus? It could be a little more because if that 4,000 was before his birth, it could be actually a little bit less. If it was later on, it could be a little more. So plus or minus. What do I mean by minus? It could be what? Now, brothers and sisters, this is serious. This is the last generation. This is the limit generation. Now, look at what's happening. Climbing the facts. 2022, earth become, 2022 becomes the eighth hottest year on what? Have you noticed that now? The earth has started getting hotter. Do you know why? Listen to me. At the end of a day of atonement, what does God do to the scapegoat? According to Leviticus 16. He lets him into the wilderness and the wilderness is the condition of the earth at the end of the day of atonement. So my question is, what is a, earth, what is a uh, wilderness like? Go to Jeremiah 50. What book did I say? Go to Jeremiah 50. Look at it quickly. We got to close. Look at it quickly. Jeremiah 50. The earth is, remember, that's a type, that's a shadow, but it has to be fulfilled, not only the event, but the time. So before 6,000 years, by the end of 6,000 years, the earth has to be in the condition of a wilderness. Now the pieces come together. In Jeremiah 50, look what the Bible says in Jeremiah 50. Oh, I can't give you all the time. Oh, I wish I could give you all night, but I can't. I guess I, I'm going to bring it to a close. Jeremiah 50. Look what the Bible says in Jeremiah 50. Look what it says. Are you there? Amen. Jeremiah 50, verse 12. Let's read verse 12. Jeremiah 50, verse 12 says, Your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hinder march of the nations shall be a, talk to me somebody, a wilderness, a what? Dry land and a... So what must happen to the earth just before the end of the 6,000 year period? It must become like a wilderness or a desert. It must become dry and hot. Look at this, brothers and sisters. This shows us now. This says the fit man is coming on time. We see him. The earth, the key to understanding all of this is to understand in the wilderness. Once we understand the wilderness, it makes sense. The wilderness is the key. Look at this. As Colorado River does what? Does what? You know that right now all over earth, they're seeing the earth, the water, it's drying up. They're wondering, they're seeing the glaciers. What's happening to the glaciers? Melting. The earth is getting ready to become an anti-typical wilderness because it's time. My brothers and sisters, God is allowing the earth to get ready. Look what it says. I can't go through this all now. I'm gonna, I want you to see a point. Look what it says. Everything's getting dry. It says water covers how much? 70% of our planet, and it is easy to think that it will also be plentiful. However, fresh water, the stuff we drink, bathe in, and irrigate our farms with is incredibly rare. Only 3% of the world's water is fresh, and two-thirds of this is tucked away in frozen glaciers of otherwise unavailable for our use. The majority of the world is this way, but they're noticing now the ecosystems are changing. The earth is drying up. Places that used to be rivers, gone. All over the world, we're seeing this. Let me go on. This says... These are the signs at the end. This says, the looming food crisis in the food 2030 report. They say we're going to have a crisis in food by 2030. If you have no water, you have no food. The world needs a water treaty. The world has enough water for 7 billion, but it not if countries waste, hoard, or weaponize. Do you know that right now, America and the UK and Europe, we represent less than 10% of the world's population, but we're using 90% of all the world's water. It says, India will soon run out of water. It says, global what? Word, water war threat by what? 2030. Now, I want to ask you a question. We see as we get down through time that water is drying up. Now, if we have about seven years, plus or minus, and we're in 2024, give me 2024 plus seven. What is that? Now, what did all the thinking men say? 2031 plus or minus about what did all the thinking men say the, and when, you, when we looked at the climate, when we looked at the history, when we looked at the uh, weather, when we looked at the economy, the ecology, all of them said 2030. 
And the Bible says the same thing. At the first coming of Christ, when the wise men, the thinking men, said it was about to happen and the prophets agreed, Jesus came the first time. Today, Jesus is about to come. But you know what the reality is? Everything is ready but us. The devil's ready. The earth is almost ready. Jesus is ready. But we're not. We're so busy with the world. Oh, I can't come to the meeting because I have work. Very soon, work will mean nothing. I can't go. My children have to go to school. Very soon, this worldly school means nothing. What should the profit of man to gain the whole world and lose it? So then we will say, I wish I'd have given my children Jesus. I wish I stopped them. I wish I had helped them. I wish, I wish, I wish. But it's going to be too late. I wouldn't be looking around. I would be looking in my own heart and saying, Lord, I'm not ready. You know, we can hide and pretend for everybody else, but Jesus sees right through us. He sees those secret sins. And he's saying today, I want to save you. I don't know about you, but I want to be saved. Do you want to be saved? I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord, brothers and sisters. I'm going to close right here. We're not even close to finishing because right now, guess what? You will find that before the 6,000 year happens, something has to happen on earth. See, 6,000 is when Jesus comes, but, but, but that's about seven years, plus or minus. But do you know that before Jesus comes, there's going to come a crisis over the Sunday law. And if, if, if the coming of Christ is 6,000, that's about seven years away, then what about the Sunday law that must come before that? I wonder what 2025 really means, plus or minus. And right now today, guess what? You know, the Pope just came to Canada two years ago. You know why he came to Canada? I, I want to show you. I can't do it. No, I can't do it tonight. I want to show you. It's behind the screen. I want to show you. I got to stop. He says, no, no, you, you, you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> well, I'm going to start right here. Listen to me. If we really understood the coming of the Lord, we would want to go into an all-night prayer meeting. We would have wished we had a meeting t- tomorrow night because we're just touching the surface. We would wish every night we had a meeting. But let me tell you something. We need to be praying. Lord, I'm not ready. We have a little time left. Help my home, my family, my children. Do you want to be ready, brothers and sisters? Can you see it clearly from the word of God? We need Jesus. We're going to stop right here. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I need Jesus. Listen, go to Luke 2. Let's close in Luke 2. Let's close in Luke 2. We're going to come back and see how deep Luke 2 really is. We're going to show you that right now in Luke chapter 2, just before the 6,000 year mark, something happens on earth. Just like before the 4,000 year generation, something happened on earth. To prove that we were in the 4,000 year generation, the same thing is going to be repeated. And Luke chapter 2, you remember, this is the birth of Christ. Luke 2 takes us to the 4,000 year period and something happens. Look at what it says in Luke 2 verse 1. The Bible says in Luke 2 verse 1, you remember Jesus came to Bethlehem. Remember that? Like the wise men said, he was born. The Bible says in verse 3, verse 3, and all were taxed, everyone in his own city. Verse 4, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed. Mary now comes pregnant. Why in the world she's coming pregnant? Can you imagine? When a woman's getting ready, how many women have been pregnant here in this room? Let me see the hand that women have been pregnant before had children. I see hands. Now tell me, when you come to the ninth month, sister, are you wanting to get on a donkey and start riding? And you, want, you don't even want to get into, you don't even want to get into a Lexus in a luxury car and ride. But imagine a donkey over the roads, cloppity clop, cloppity clop. You, you, if you didn't have it yet, you're going to have it. But she goes, and we're going to find out why tomorrow. Not tomorrow now, but we, we, we're going to find out why she had to go. There's a reason. Now, my brothers and sisters, but what caused her to go? Look at verse 1. Verse 1. Verse 1 says, and it came to pass in those days that there went out. Talk to me, somebody. A now, what is the decree? Give me another name for a decree. A law. Now, who passed this law? It came from Caesar Augustus. Who was Caesar Augustus over? Rome. Rome. Now, my brothers and sisters, what was Rome at that time? Rome was the world's superpower. So the world's superpower passed a law just before the 4,000-year period. Question, who is the new Rome today? Who is the new superpower today? The United States of America. America is going to pass a law 
just before the 6,000 year period, the national sin law. And when that passes on earth, something happens in heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, and do you know that Roman Catholic Church and the United States of America are going to join to pass this law and to bring the final time of trouble? And do you know that when she came here, it was to heal the wound of the papacy? You remember she met with the indigenous tribes here in Rome. And the, the newspaper said, to heal the wound. We don't understand. I'm going to show you by God's grace. And my brothers and sisters, Canada is going to be one of the first that goes along with this movement. And we're not ready. And the reason that Jesus was born where he was born. You, you know where Jesus was born? Was Jesus born in the Hilton? Where was he born? Do you know that the same reason why Jesus was born in a manger is the reason why we will be lost? You say, what do I mean? Look at what it says as we close. The Bible says in Luke 2, beginning in verse 7, in verse 7, let's read that together. It says, and she brought forth her firstborn son, that is Jesus, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why? Because. Why, Jesus? Why were you born in a manger with animals? Because there was no room. And I'm going to tell you something. The only reason, the only reason why we'll be lost is because we're so busy that we have no room for Jesus. He's standing, knocking, knocking, calling to old and young alike. Do you want to make room for him today? If that's your desire, to make room for Jesus, I want you to reverently kneel with me wherever you are. To say, Lord, as you kneel, I want to make room. I've been too busy. I've given the work. I've given time. I've given play. I've given relationships. But tonight, I want to start over. Heavenly Father, you have been with us tonight. We see clearly that the end of all things is at hand. And Lord, we're praying for a few more years of grace. Please. Lord, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to make it to 2026 without a crisis, a civil war, a Sunday law. But Lord, you can work a miracle. I'm begging you for a few more years. You told us to pray this. But Lord, we know you cannot wait much longer, Lord, because though we are about at it, plus or minus, there is a limit. This generation shall not pass. We don't have 50 years. This generation. Please, Lord, help us to make room for you tonight. I stop the prayer. I pause it. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. There's someone here that says, Lord, I haven't given you enough room, but I want to. I need help. I can't do it, but you can help me. Just raise your hand. You may be up. You may be down. Your eyes are closed. You're not looking at me. Your eyes are closed. On the internet, your eyes are closed. You're praying to God. This is real. I want a revival. Save my family. Be with my children. Lord, I've been so careless that they don't even, they don't respect me. How can they respect God? Please, Lord, I want to start over. Is there a young person that says, Lord, I need Jesus. Heavenly Father, you see every lifted hand. I'm lifting mine. Lord, help us to make room for Jesus. For if you come in, the devil must go out. And then, Lord, you can finish the work and bring a sinless congregation so that you can come out of that most holy place on time and crush Satan's head and win the great controversy. Eden lost can become Eden restored and we can live happily ever after. That's not a fairy tale. That's the story and history of redemption. And we're now in the last chapter approaching the final page. Please, Lord, help us. Be with every lifted hand, we pray. Keep us and bring us back on Friday night. Let nothing stop us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Are you happy you were here tonight? Did you learn anything? Do you want some more? We are only touched the surface. Oh, brothers and sisters, let's pray for each other. Amen. I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. In the night when there's no meeting, pray for the meetings. Pray for yourself, for your family. Pray for your children. And then we'll see each other back on Friday night. What time? 
57. <laughs> may God bless you. Let's make room for Jesus. You may consider yourselves as we get ready to sing dismissed. May God bless you.